Here we go. We're we're going live a second time. Oh. Is that American? Uh, no. Tyler Stafford again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, guys, wake up, tune up, tune in. This is the Unsigned Podcast. We are the Unsigned, those artists, musicians, and industry professionals who are not waiting for a record deal to do it for us. I'm your host, singer-songwriter Ben Alfrey. This is Tyler Stafford here. We're doing Morning. round two of this uh, of this episode, this interview, because the first 20 minutes were um, sound problems. So um, before Very we... intimate conversation. Yeah, it was. Time. It was a really good, a good <laughs> conversation, too. But before we get any further... I want to. I just want to sneak in and share this out to my page, and Tyler's going to do the same thing if he hasn't done it already, um, and that way we have a little more visibility here. So uh, anyway, please, if you're following along, please share the page too, or share the share the video, tag a friend, do all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just going to put it here on my personal page and say, and say Tyler Stafford. Live, join in, and I'm gonna put that there. And then, do you do you need the link, Tyler? Did that? Yeah, why don't you do that again? Did that work last time. Uh, yeah, yeah, put it hold on. There, yep, we got a little feedback. That's okay. All right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna put, paste the link there. Oh, wait. oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, you got that link. There's Josh again. Hey, Josh. Yeah, we're. Uh, Thanks for coming back. Yeah, we're we're pretty hacky this morning, but that's okay. Um, uh, join in by liking Tyler Stafford. Tyler Stafford music. Liking unsigned. Uh, tagging a friend in the comments and leaving a comment of your own. And share this <laughs> live video. Okay, so I've got my little pinned post. I am ready to go now. Mr. Joshua Ortiz, please let us know if the sound sucks again. It shouldn't. I, I, think, I think we got it under control right now. But um, uh, just in case, and yeah, please, uh, please tag Todd South again because we were, we were talking about Todd. Um, Todd, if you're, I, I can't tell if you're, if you're in this yet, but um, we were talking, we were trying to figure out where we first met. So let me, yeah. let me kind of loop, loop around to the beginning of this. So I have Tyler Stafford in studio today. Tyler is a local guy in Reno here, um, and he's got, he's got a really good following, really good songwriter, all, all that stuff. But he's local, so that's why he's in the studio today. And I feel like we've gone, we go back like eight or 10 years and, and we were trying to figure out where we first met. We don't know. It was probably an open mic or something like that. But um, I think Todd South was probably involved in that because he was the big, big open mic guy there for a while. Um, oh, and we were talking about, you haven't done an interview like this before. You've only done print stuff. Oh, right. Yeah. We've, so we've been a live feed conversational type interview, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Yeah. It actually, um, it makes more sense to me to do it that way because then, I mean, I'm not good with words in the moment. Usually I'm, I like to take my time and write it down, but when you're doing a quick interview for a, for a TV or not for, or even TV, TV or print, you never know what they're going to take and what they're not and how they're going to implement into their article. So this is nice to just be able to talk and. Oh yeah. This way you can't yeah, be. If I screw school. up then I'll, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If yeah. I screw up, I can <laughs> clarify or do something like that. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Everybody's got the full record. I see that three people are watching right now already. You see that there's this little number up in the corner. Oh, perfect. That's kind of fun to watch. Um, the, cool. the top, I think the, the record is 15 live viewers Ooh, okay. on unsigned. Um, and that was from these guys in, in Sweden. Um, this band named Athena. There's so Unsigned has like a Swedish invasion going on. Oh, um, cool. I interviewed a guy from Sweden, and by the way, just to tuck away in the back of your head, toward the end of this, I'm going to ask you to call out three people you would like to see sitting in that chair. Oh, good. So anyway, I did that to this this guy that I interviewed from Sweden. He called out some other people from Sweden who called out some other people, and now I have this whole Swedish thing going on. Awesome. And so, um, so one of them from last time. Uh, I think it was the, just like 
Saturday, I think, was their interview. But um, yeah, they had like 15 live viewers and they've got almost a thousand views on the thing already. I don't know what they're doing. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, I don't know how'd what you, they're doing. How'd you, and how'd you come across them? How'd you find them? Well, because I interviewed a different guy from Sweden who called them out. And so oh, okay. I just tag them. Like any, anybody you call out, I'll that's, tag them in this episode. Yeah, it's great exposure. It's yeah. Exposure. yeah. And then that first guy, um, well, how I bootstrapped this whole thing is I just started uh, like finding people on Reddit. Okay. Just because people post music on Reddit. And so I was just listening to stuff and I'd just be like, hey, I like your stuff. Do you want to, you know, come on the come on the show yeah um and that's where that's where i found that guy that first guy from sweden mm -hmm. so and now the thing's booked out like through like may 10th i'm booked out like solid every day that's great for over a month yeah do something this. right i guess i mean <laughs> it's cool to have like all these you know talk to all these people and stuff um so all right so we were talking like on the last episode that we cut off we were talking about you play baseball in high school, and mm. um, I, but I wouldn't have hated you because you sort of blended in with all kinds of different groups and stuff right. like that. Um, and you played outfield, is that what you said? Yeah. So um, yeah, in high school, I ended up I played center field, uh, and then uh, when it came time to graduate, I didn't really have. Uh, really interested in much academically <laughs> nothing really jumped out at me yeah so i i just uh for for baseball i probably wouldn't have even gone to college probably just started working and then hopefully it would have eventually yeah, maybe you would have ended up yeah. in the same spot kept playing music but you never know yeah so yeah. you so you moved to bakersfield to play baseball bakersfield for a couple of years um and then i was uh, ended up down in phoenix arizona i played division two baseball uh down there and then essentially the whole time that i was Going to school and and playing baseball, I had my guitar with me. And what's what's Division Two? Is that uh, so? You've, you've got like your top tier collegiate um, sort of uh, competition, like the Division Ones, like uh, UNR, a lot, a lot of the bigger schools, a lot of the March Madness schools and stuff like that that just play basketball. It's kind of like Division One uh, basketball. So, so Division One is like the biggest schools, essentially. Yeah, it's kind of like the ratings for high schools too, with like. 4A, 3A, that type of thing. Okay. I, I think. Cool. I <laughs> yeah. I'm not the expert, but yeah. And, and by the way, for everybody watching, please say hi, because <clears throat> sometimes we can see that you're watching, but we can't see who you are unless you say hi. Um, I think I can tell if, like, if one of my friends joins, I'll, it'll identify them like Josh I'll joined. for that. But if it's just some Facebook rando who's not my friend, I won't see... It won't tell me who who they are, or whatever, and then we can't say hi because we because we don't see who you are. Um, so okay, so so just tracking this a little bit. So you went to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard that the girls are prettier in Phoenix, and that mm -hmm. um, and and two of my friends just within the last couple months have moved to Phoenix not for that but uh -huh. just right. like what's happening in Phoenix what's going <laughs> they, on in if Phoenix? they moved there for that they probably didn't make a great life choice but <laughs> <laughs> there's gotta be a better better there's reason, be a better better reason. Down there. not that the um, Phoenix girls aren't pretty but but that shouldn't be no. the reason to move to it to a city no not at all um yeah I'm trying to think who's that who's who's Grace Larkins Grace Tyler rocks. She says, I'll, "I'll be calling her out for your podcast." Oh, really? She'll, she'll be one of the ones. Yeah, I call out. Um, I don't know if that's something. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I have no idea. Well, I've never been there, so I I couldn't say. Yeah. But um, I do know that wherever I go, the grass seems a little greener. I think that's part of it. So <laughs> I think that is. Yeah, yeah. So so I don't know, but um, but anyway, like Phoenix seems to be growing right now but like you left all that behind a long time ago right yeah I've, I'm trying to think of when I, I'm not good with the years or any of that stuff but I, I want to say maybe 90 or uh, 2007 maybe moved back from there 2006 2007 oh and that's then, about when I moved to Reno again okay so that's probably how we, we ended up probably crossing paths at that I, I think my first open mic I played was in 2008 is that still over at May 10? From, that was upstairs at May 10, yeah. That's probably, so that's where, probably we, where we came across. Yeah, that's probably where we met. That, that was 
in my opinion, that was the best open mic venue I've, oh, I've yeah. seen um, in town. That, um, that that venue and Todd, who, who Todd South, who ran that venue, uh, was the reason why I really got super connected into the music scene so fast. Because everybody would come through there, and everybody knows somebody else, and then that kind of... Yeah. Uh, a lot yeah. of relationships from there. Um, and just to kind of describe <laughs> that for anybody who doesn't know what that was or whatever, there were... There was this um, this music store, and upstairs they had like they had a whole like I want to call it like a banquet room or something. It was just a big multi-purpose room, but there was a stage. There was I think a piano built yeah. into it. Really good PA. For, yeah, for an open mic, a really professional setup. Yeah, and then there were there were couches and chairs, and like it was a listening room. Like all yeah. the chairs were facing the same way. They had like a little table of refreshments at the back, but it was like yeah. a serious listening room. They, they brought down the lights. They had the spotlights on the stage. Yeah. They, you made, know, you, they made you feel like a rock star. It was great. They did. Yeah. yeah. And that, that was, that was like Todd's thing, that was, you know? Yeah. And then, um, I think Maytan started kind of just getting into financial problems or whatever. And, uh, they didn't, they didn't want Todd in there anymore. So then he bounced around from like one place to the next, but, to me, like the golden, the golden age of Reno open mics was was that May Ten room. There was that, and then another, t uh, even long before that, Todd ran uh, the open mic at Walden's, which is right next door, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is funny uh, for a long time. And that was the biggest thing that I remember hearing about in high school. Uh, that I, before I even played music, I would hear about that, and uh, I'd go down every once in a while and check it out, but. Before At Walden's? Even, yeah, before I even played music. He he was running that for a long time. Wait, but Maytan was before Walden's. No. It was Walden's, Walden's and then Maytan? Way before that, yeah. Todd would, Todd would be able to f iron out, like, yeah. the time frame on that. But it was, when I was in high school in, I mean, it was probably late 90s, early 2000s. Oh. So it must have been Walden's, then Maytan, then back to Walden's. But, uh, and, so. th and then... And then Walden's was cool for a while, but then they started switching stuff up too. I don't know, like life moves on and it's not centered around the open mic. And so businesses change and everything. Wildflower yeah. after that, but then they got torn down. There's probably going to be townhomes put in over there now. Yeah, um, it's crazy. I think a lot of it has to do with, unfortunately, a lot of it has to do with like the ASCAPs and the BMIs that come in and get yeah. into these smaller businesses that want to host something fun for local, like a local night. Nobody's really making a ton of money off of it, but they come in and demand that they pay all these royalty fees. And it's an, it's, it's that overhead expense that businesses can't, yeah, <laughs> they can't of that size can't handle. Yeah. And it's hard if you start saying no covers at your open mic, like nobody can, it's originals only like that. Yeah. That makes it hard for some people who aren't songwriters yet. That makes so, sense. Yeah. Yeah. You know who could you know who could be the listening room now that that potentialist workshop in town? Do you know I that? still haven't been down there, and I feel really bad because I know that I got that's where that's guys. where Spike's uh, Spike and Greg and and Brandon are doing their studio down there, right? The potentialist that's that's Pan's thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I I actually don't know a lot about that. I just went down there for um, Nick it's, Ang's it's studio. Has, well. It, okay, so it's three things. It's it's an art gallery, right? And then it's workspace, like ten by ten workspaces for the artists. That's another section of the place. And then in the back, they have a whole stage and lighting system and oh, okay. PA and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Like they could they could host a pretty solid open mic type listening room. I don't know if they want to or if they've tried that, but they it's definitely could. I know that uh, I've also talked with Renee. Um, oh, Mountain Music and Donna at Mountain Music, and their their little room would be great for that. I thought I always thought that it would be cool to have a music venue, host an open mic one of the nights, and then pull your. Uh, actually, Todd did that a long time ago. Pull from that and do some feature stuff on Friday, Saturday nights. Yeah, not, Todd was doing that. People coming through, get some kids some a chance for some exposure and to put on a real show that, for themselves and make a little bit of money. And, yeah, yeah. Well, Renee's going to come on unsigned eventually. Oh, good. Just to talk about her place. It's a, such a cool little space. I haven't been there. Like, when I was there, she first... It was just she had she had first gotten it, and, you know, like, the whole... There was, like, a whole basement area that was... That had not been... Nothing had been done with it yet. And mm. So I don't know how far along 
things are or like how much it's changed but it was a cool little spot yeah. back then I, I imagine it's only gotten better I hope so because they're, they're, they're her and uh, her husband Don are they're sweethearts and they've hosted some really good shows already just a couple that I, a lot unfortunately I don't get to go to a lot of them because I'm playing too but um, they had Muriel Anderson who's a phenomenal uh, fingerstyle guitarist over there just a few months ago I feel like she might be I think she's on my list she yeah, she'd be a good one to talk to she's been in it for a long time she, she's a big name who's that oh Craig Craig joined us Craig Prather oh good he yeah joined on the last one before it kind oh of, did he uh, <laughs> yeah yeah cool um yeah, say hi guys if you're if you're just joining in or if you have a question or something. We're just we're talking about pretty much nothing right now. We're just we're just kind of going through like Reno history, which it's interesting if you live in Reno, I guess. But um, so okay, so when did you start? Like when did you pick up a guitar? I didn't pick up the guitar until maybe halfway through my senior year of high school. Okay, so that uh, fifteen years ago. <laughs> no. Yeah, I so, guess. okay, so, but like, so while you were playing baseball and going to college and all that, you were, yeah, you had, were already playing, writing songs? Uh, it, not really, I think first songs I started writing were, um, I was maybe 21, 22, started to kind of put stuff together, it may have been earlier than that, but just pieces of, little bits and pieces, nothing full, start to finish. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But a, a lot of times, I, I, I don't even think my friends knew I played guitar, because I, I would play mostly just in my bedroom by myself, learning songs and just playing constantly. Yeah. They yeah. might have known I played, but didn't, wouldn't have thought anything of it. Okay, and so then you finished school in Phoenix, and then what made you decide to move to Reno again? Um, I was just kind of over... I, I wasn't interested in, in really competing... Playing, playing baseball anymore and I'd never really settled on anything that I was studying that I it was exciting to me <laughs> it always seemed like I had to finish something because I had to it was a, a part of the requirements nothing I really wanted to continue to do except for all I really wanted to do was play guitar yeah it seemed like and I, I didn't think that that was I didn't think, even think to study music which now might be something in the future to do Hey, YouTube is out there. <laughs> you can learn a lot from YouTube. Yeah. All right, so so it's like 2006. You're moving back to Reno. And that, then that's when you're realizing you want to pursue the guitar like more seriously or pursue songwriting or just the whole... Is it performance that you were after? Like, I don't know if it was even a necess necessarily like something that I was thinking about on like pursuing. As I, I, I remember thinking that I had written a few songs. Uh, a friend of mine um, and I worked together for his dad doing construction stuff up at uh, North Star. This is actually probably, yeah, this was probably like 2007 and then coming into the spring of 2008. Um, we played we played guitar together and just and shared some songs. He wrote some songs and we'd play some covers together and stuff and just hang out for family and friends uh, when we were hanging out. And then I think just one day, on a Friday night at work, I found out about the Maytan thing, and I was like, hey, I think I'm going to go <laughs> go down and sign up and play some songs uh -huh. of mine and just see kind of what the open mic's all about. And then, uh, so I think I called my parents on the way back into town or something like that. I was like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And I, I think I was the first one there, and I signed up, and I signed up first on the list, and then I got super nervous because <laughs> I wasn't sure what to expect. But um, <laughs> it was more so that I just had songs, and I, wanted, I, I just was curious. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Craig says Tyler's great. Oh, good thanks. to see you, Ben. Yeah, good to see you, Craig. I haven't. Shoot, when was the last time I saw Craig anywhere? I haven't seen you in a long time either. Yeah, where are you hiding, man? Um, <laughs> this is a total locals show today. This is funny this to is me. This is great. I thought it'd be better to be in the studio, anyways. I'm not good with technology and trying to. Oh yeah, out no, all this stuff is not good with me. Uh, the false start we had probably would have been a lot worse if we if we tried to like mix Skype into it or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see. So I came back. I came back around two thousand six. Um, 
<clears throat> and then, but it wasn't really until like 2010 that I really started hitting the open mic scene here in Reno. Mm -hmm. And by then I had already, I was living in Santa Barbara for a while and I had already, um, like done a songwriter group down there and I had done a bunch of open mic stuff down there. So I kind of, I had sort of started homing in on, on like just how to perform, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Like, um, so by the time I got here and got involved in like the open mic with Todd and stuff like that, I was, I was sort of like, I understood what was going on. Right. You know? And I was like, okay, I know, I know what this is. I, I know I can do this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I was telling this story the other day on on unsigned, but like I went to uh, I went to Nashville and did some open mics there. Mm -hmm. That's a completely different experience mm -hmm. yeah. because, like, I feel like um, sort of like the 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 skill level that you that you find here in in Reno. Um, where you're actually out playing gigs and stuff like that, like that's kind of the open mic bar in, in Nashville. In other words, guys as good as you are playing open mics in Nashville. And so you walk in there and you're just like, damn, this is not, this is not like the normal open mic, you know, kind of yeah. caliber I'm used to because like these are guys who could play professionally. It just happens that they're not. And so they're all coming to the open mic. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, so like it's, it's, I, I, I had never experienced that kind of thing before I went to Nashville, but I bet LA and New York are like that too, where you get like really, really good musicians, you know, playing, open. yeah, playing in, at, at the open mic or, or like you hear about, um, these little like stand up comedy places where they'll have some big name, just like walk in and yeah. do a set or something like that. So, um, we don't have too much of that here in Reno that I'm aware of, but I think the bigger the city gets and the more densely populated those, the, the arts community gets, I think that's what has to happen. There's so many people that want to play. And the, the thing that I realized about like, uh, Nashville open mics and Los Angeles open mics are typically you get one song, one or two songs, depending on how crowded it is on the night and they'll pack Actually, San Francisco is the same way. I had the same same experience in San Francisco, but they'll pack forty or fifty people in in a night, and you get up, play your song, get off, and it's like it tends to be. I think maybe like higher concentration of people that you really stop and listen to, whereas in open mics uh, in smaller communities tend to be a little bit more hit and miss. But it's a little bit less about. That, uh, about really showcasing and being like the top dog and more about the community of everybody involved. Yeah. I, I feel like <laughs> it's, it's a weird, it's a weird mix. I went, so I, I went to Nashville one year <laughs> and, um, I totally lucked out because I, I got, um, I got to play at the Bluebird open mic yeah. and at the Commodore open mic uh -huh. or not open mic show like a showcase thing. So or I guess it was their open mic, but so here's what happened at the bluebird. I was standing in line. Uh, they have this big long line that goes out, you know, and like you get your little ticket, which is pretty much like you're coming back next time. I mean, the chance, oh, right. the chances of you getting your number drawn that week are, are not great. So, uh, you know, but then this guy who was standing in front of me, I was just kind of chatting with him and stuff. And he's like, I don't, I don't want to play tonight. Um, you know, here's mine. And he gave me his and his was, his was like, um, his was a, uh, sorry, somebody just messaged me. Um, oh, <laughs> Brittany's messaging me while we're, while we're talking. Um, hang on, we got to get caught up on messages here. Oh, cool. Uh, oh, Craig's, oh, they're just, they're just chatting amongst themselves. Craig, yeah, okay, Craig and Josh, great. Craig Network and Josh are chatting. Network yeah. up. <laughs> um, we need to get share share the video so that we can get over what is it, fifteen viewers? Yeah, we gotta push this up guys. We're trying uh, to we're trying to raise the bar this episode. Yeah, Craig, please <laughs> uh, please share this out. Uh, Josh, please share this out. We wanna we wanna see if we can break the twenty live viewer twenty threshold. That's yeah, we're we're only seventeen away. Um, oh there we go. 
Somebody, somebody tag, uh, like somebody tag Brittany Straw and tell her to share it too, because she's she's messaging me in Facebook Messenger while this thing is going on. So yeah, we need uh, there we, go. we need every oh there's there's she's Brittany on. right right there. Okay, Brittany, it's easier for us to talk now because I can't I can't type to you right now. But um, anyway, so so okay, so I'm in Nashville. This guy hands me his ticket, and I'm thinking, all right, so now I just have two tickets. But then I realize. His is one of the <clears throat> go back tickets from like a previous week. So his was a guaranteed oh yeah get on tonight. And he handed it to me. So I was like, awesome, I get to go on the bluebird. And then they then they tell me like, yeah, you've got like five minutes or something. Yeah. And I'm thinking, five minutes, that's not even two songs. How do you know what do I do? So so I did something stupid and I tried to like basically <laughs> like do like a live like mix of like live sample of my different songs, oh, like a, like a big uh, medley of yeah, like <laughs> like a medley big sample. Play. play a little of this yeah. one, and then switch into the next one. Yeah, and um, and you know, I ended it. Dun, 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 and I was like, yeah, played in Nashville, you know. Yeah, and like everybody was like, whatever, and they just went back to what they were doing. So I was like, fuck, that didn't go like I wanted it to. Yeah, um, and uh, then I went back to Barbara. Floyd, who runs who runs the thing um, and has always run it, and I was like, "So what happened to Garth Brooks when he went up there?" And she's like, "No, that's not what happened to Garth Brooks when he went up there." <laughs> so, what's well, um, funny how it's psychologically it makes you like completely second guess yourself and third guess yourself and fourth guess yourself all while you're waiting for your own set. He's like, "Okay, I have five minutes. Should I play half of two songs? Should I should I mix them together? Or should I just play one song? Or what what should I do? What am I?" What yeah. do you get these people's attention when I get up there? You have, it makes you overthink every side of things where it's like, oh, just get up, pick a song, play it. If they like it, awesome. Yeah, and yeah. You like, have to like make a break chance on earth. earth. Yeah, it's not going to make or break you um, I, yeah, emotionally. I, but <laughs> I, mean, I agree now. Okay, wait, let's see. Brittany says, oh, she shared it. Thanks, Brittany. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Craig. Everybody shared it. Um, yeah, awesome. Awesome. Okay, the... The next level for you serious players is to tag a friend in the comments. That's Do it. that's the next level of, of Facebook networking. Um, okay, yeah. so so yeah, so I was moping around for a couple of days after that, thinking, "Wow, I just like really got kicked out of Nashville right there." And, oh, okay. Um, but then I went I went to the Commodore. And they had they had some kind of open mic. Was Debbie? Is yeah, Debbie Champion. Yep. Yeah, Debbie. She's, she's a sweet. Yeah, she's a sweet lady. Yeah. Um, we. Uh, and so she's. She's up. The, uh, so she's running the thing, and I just kind of slide up to her and I go, uh, "Hey, how does how does one get down this? Uh, how do I get from here to there?" And pointing to the stage, and and she's like, "Well, you got to get on the list and you know do all this stuff," and it's like four months, you know, like a, a waiting yeah. list or something. And I'm like, oh man, uh, I'm only here for the week, you know, so I guess, I guess I'm not going to do that. Um, and then she says, well, I mean, I do have a no show tonight, so like you could come on tonight. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, oh really? Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, totally. And she says, well, do you have a guitar? And I said, I think I can find one. Cause like everybody, yeah, everybody in the place. Yeah. And so I seriously just went up to I just I went up to some people and I said I said okay look I'm from out of town I have a chance to be up there like in five minutes I need somebody's guitar and yeah. they're just like dude here you go yeah so I went up there and um, played played some of my stuff some some full songs and stuff and um, and like that was a totally different room yeah and that's when I figured out something. Something went sideways with Bluebird, and now it's now it's like it's all touristy now. You know, everybody wants to go, like, go listen to stuff at the Bluebird, but they're not necessarily. Uh, and I, I mean, I don't want to like paint with too broad a brush, but at least the, when I was there, it was like spring break, and there were a bunch of people from out of town. The audience at the Bluebird was not the normal Nashville audience. It was right. like a bunch of tourists and out of towners and. They just they didn't know what they, what what was happening. They're just like I'm at the Bluebird. Yeah, totally. But Commodore doesn't have that you know that reputation. So at Commodore, it was a room full of songwriters and people like that. Right. And that was t 
totally different. You know, like, you know, I had people talking to me afterwards being like, dude, yeah, yeah. And blah, blah, you know, like having those kinds of conversations that, that, um, you know, I, well, I don't know that I'd like expected it, but like, I, I know, I know I'm at least a capable enough songwriter that, you know, if I go perform something and other songwriters hear it, you know, we're probably going to get to talking a little bit. Right. And when that didn't happen at Bluebird, I was just like, I don't know. I felt like I was on the moon or something. So, so that was, that was a really bizarre experience, but the Commodore was, was really validating. And then I realized, okay, yeah, like that was super, um, that was super good. And, and even like later in the week, I got feedback from publishers that like, you know, your stuff's not country enough or whatever. Right. And I was fine with that because I had that experience at the Commodore and I was, I was f fine with like, okay, sure. It doesn't fit your market. That's fine. I had other songwriters say, I like that. And that was enough for me, right. you know, in Nashville. So, so yeah, the open mic scene in Nashville is, is completely different than, than, um, what we find here. But, um, well, you spent time out in Nashville, I thought. I've been Where out. Have I heard that? I've probably been out four times in the last two years. Um, the thing, I, I don't know what, when that experience of yours was. When, it was when, like four years ago or something. Okay, so I know that going out, because I've played both, both Bluebird and um, Commodore places. Um, Bluebird is weird, and a lot of places are starting to get to the point where they're so busy, they'll, they, you have to call in after a certain hour they receive your message and then whatever message they receive your uh, your call in, if that makes any sense, um, that's how they put your, their list together. And the Bluebird, I think they only took maybe 25 uh, players on the night and you have to call in between a certain time and if you don't get through, you don't get in, which is kind of weird now. Yeah, I remember that too. They're, they're not the only place that does it that way. No, huh? Um, I want to see if I can tag Barbara Cloyd. Um, I don't know if I. Uh, I'll just tag. I'll just tag her. Um, her little Facebook. Um, her little Facebook thing. Um, yeah. But I, th I think the which you, you bring up a good point with the. Which you what you have to thanks Brittany. Brittany tagged some people. Oh, cool. Brittany tagged a whole bunch of people. Sweet. You rock, girl. Well, you have to realize in uh, open mic scenes and that sort of thing, especially when you get into the bigger markets, is you have to learn something from every five minutes that you get to play. So your experience of the Bluebird was... Don't do medleys. That's <laughs> Don't do medleys, but also, I mean, you're not every night that you play isn't going to be the best night. And yeah. sometimes it depends more on the room and the audience than it does about your actual performance. Because if people are totally. not into it that night and you think you have the best set of your life, sometimes you're going to be super let down. And sometimes you're going to go up there and feel like you you just you messed everything up, kind of shit the bed, and then you'll get 10 people come up to it afterwards like, man, that's the, that's the best thing I've seen like all week. I've had you have no idea what... It's yeah. psychologically... It just messes with you. But you have to know that... Sometimes it's you, sometimes it's the room. Yeah. And you have to be okay with that. I've had both of those things happen, <clears throat> and, and we've talked about this on other episodes too, like the importance of um, like getting out of town and playing different rooms, playing for different crowds. Because playing for people that have never seen you before. And yeah. Don't, that, that did not come to see you. Yeah. That's, those are the ones that are the best ones to get, <laughs> I think. That, that's, a, that's a tough room to play, but when it goes well it's really validating too because because yeah. then it's like okay i can still capture a stranger's you know interest like yeah. and that's and that 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 is something that is like that's a a milestone i remember the first time the first time i did that i thought it was i mean that was the best feeling like oh this guy doesn't know me he doesn't owe me anything and he likes he likes my stuff like i'm connecting yeah. I, that's an actual connection but yeah i've had situations where I played great and got nothing back. And then I've had situations where I didn't even want to be there and I just kind of mailed it in. And people came up to me afterwards and said, man, that was so great. That was like yeah. the perfect atmospheric music, man. So yeah, it really is about like how their night's going. And, and the, the only thing that that teaches me too in a grander scheme of things is that you never know who is actually listening and who's not. So we all kind of fall into slumps when we're playing, especially when we're gigging as, um, as much as we are. 
sometimes you just don't have it in you. <laughs> You've got a four hour gig and it's like you want to just sit back and, and like you said, put it on autopilot. But I try and think of that every single night that I'm playing. Like sometimes maybe a set here and there is going to be like, all right, that got done. Thank God that's over with. But for the most part, I'm, I'm playing my balls off. And he yeah. said that you come in to see me if but you never know who's there listening. And you never know who's going to want to buy a CD and follow you afterwards or something well, like that. So show them a best performance, even if you've got a... So are you, are you like music 24-7 now? I mean, do you do anything else besides music? I've been making a living playing music for about five years, I think. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. So, okay, so five years, mm -hmm. so that's 2013. What, what, that happened in two, right. what happened in 2013? Like, what... I mean, what happened where you decided, I think I can, I think I can, like, make this leap now? It was really just uh, being aware of my circumstances. I was working in a restaurant for a long time, or for, I think I worked in the restaurant for about, about five years. And I would work at the restaurant and play my gigs. And that was, that was fine. And then it got to a point where I was not, not looking forward to going in and working at the normal shifts and, and that sort of thing. And I was thinking maybe I was picking up enough gigs and busy enough in the summertime that I'd seriously considered doing that. And it was probably two years after I'd thought that it was a possibility in working, taking left, less uh, restaurant shifts, picking up more gigs and kind of tilting the scale that way. And then uh -huh. at a certain point I was just like, I'm here two days a week. I'm making like 30, 40 bucks a shift not worth it. You don't need <laughs> like, it. You, don't need I, it. you just yeah. finally got to the point where it just made sense. Yeah, so that's that's interesting because, you know, a lot of people when they want to go into business for themselves, they 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 hit that challenge of, well, I can't quit my day job, but right. you know, like how do I transition? And and you had a flexible enough job that you could gradually taper right. off. So, yeah, it's okay. hard, I think it's harder to do if you're a professional. Yeah, like if you have like an office job or something, they're just yeah. like, no, we need you here. It's 40 hours a week or nothing. Yeah. You know? And that's, and that's a, I'm glad that I never got into that. I got, I got offered a management position in the restaurant that I was in that would have been probably 60 hours a week. And, and I just knew, I was like, that's not where I'm, that's not where I'm headed. And it's, yeah, it's not a career path for me. If I'm actually going to do something other than music, I'm going to pick something that I'm into, at least. So, something a little more enjoyable. And yeah, a little more fulfilling than that, but um, it's it's a, the heart. The deeper you get into a job like that, unless you use that to save money, and and then you can propel yourself from there too. I mean, there's always a way to do it if you. Yeah, a flexible job helps. Think about it. flexible. Yeah, you can't you can't beat something like that. Something there's no attachments to. Nothing you take home with you. Yeah, I've always done um, <clears throat> software stuff, and pretty much always on a freelance basis. So I have like. Yeah the ultimate flexible schedule. Um, but I have other things that, that kind of keep me, keep me close to home. And, and, um, mm -hmm. um, what was I going to say? Oh, so, but I would have never gone into that in the first place if, uh, if I didn't have like the support system of, you know, at the time I was, I was married and she had a, a regular job. Yeah. And so we were kind of looking at that thinking like, okay, well, we can sort of scrape by on your regular job so we can afford to, you know, take this risk and like have right. me like jump into this freelancing stuff. Um, and then, you know, now that I'm in it and the ball's rolling, like it's fine. There's, yeah. you know, like I make all my bills that way and everything's fine. But, um, but I probably would have had a hard time doing it in the first place if I had, if I needed to work a full time normal job and then you know, do something on the side. So, yeah. I yeah. Mean, and I was lucky enough to be, I mean, just got done with school, was back working single. I mean, no real responsibilities other than just to yeah. take care of myself. But you're not single now, right? No, I actually uh, got married in September. Yeah. 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 I think I saw that on, yeah. on Facebook. Well, cause I saw you guys, I saw you guys walking up the hill that one day in Sierraville. Right, going to the hot springs. Yeah, and I, and I didn't, I didn't recognize her. I mean, we don't see each other that often, though. Right. So, like, how long have you guys been together? Uh, we, it'll be 
nine years this summer. Oh, that's we that's met, kind right. of unbelievable. Then that that I had never met her before. Well, she we've always sort of worked um, sort of similar schedules, and then also she she works uh, nights and weekends. So normally when I'm playing. And oh, she, she that's, usually can't make it. That's probably why, because usually when I see you, it's like we're even out like somewhere. our close friends hardly ever see her unless it's like an off day and we actually make a plan to get together. That's funny. Yeah, that's funny. So, um, I mean, gosh, the plight of the musician, especially the traveling musician, is trying to maintain a relationship with somebody. Now, you're you're out traveling around, right? Actually, I don't travel as much as a lot of my friends do, so I'm. I keep it within about, say, 90% of the time, about a 100-mile radi- radius from Reno. So what's what's in 100 miles from here? So not Sacramento. Uh, I don't really go down to Sacramento. Uh, I don't make it over the hill that, that often. A couple, Occasionally I get down to the Bay Area, um, but mostly Gray Eagle, um, Tahoe, and like Gardnerville, Gardnerville area. Do you do like festivals too, or or mostly just? Um... I've submitted to a lot, and I've gotten in a couple of times. Um, it's a difficult thing to do when you're doing that for yourself. I think if I if I had somebody representing me that had some connections, although I did just I had a friend that uh, gave me some connections, uh, direct connections to some people that book. So hopefully that'll help out a lot too. Yeah, yeah. Like festivals tend to get hundreds of submissions for for each festival they've got for whatever it is, 20, 20 slots or 30 slots on a weekend. So it, it's kind of difficult to break through that unless you kind of know somebody, I think. So do you work mostly like just <clears throat> recurring gigs then? Or, or I mean, yeah. Yeah, a lot of, uh, I stay busy paying bills, mostly casino work. Yeah, because, I mean, because the, like, the argument that I've heard so many times is that you'll, you'll burn out a, a local area, you know, you'll saturate it and, and it'll become progressively harder and harder to get gigs locally and that you, you're forced to expand out. But you haven't found that to be the case. You play the, you play the casino gigs yeah. and are you able to like mix in some originals along with some covers or how, how does it, yeah. how does it work at, at casinos? Casinos, I, t- I tend to do about Probably now, probably like fifty-fifty originals covers. You get, it's kind of goes back to knowing your audience, knowing the room, and who you're playing to. Um, and casinos are kind of nice because they don't necessarily expect you to promote it. There, there are a few of them that are a little bit different. Like uh, the Pepper Mill is is something that's kind of more promotional. Um, but a lot of a lot of times, they just want you playing music and keeping people engaged so that they're sitting there drinking and and having a good time gambling and spending a little bit more money than they maybe would have or st- sticking yeah. around your spot. Um, so, so are you with a band then? or No, just solo. And which, That's impressive though. Uh, a lot of my, yeah, a lot of my friends, especially in bands. There's a, uh, a couple guys that I know, Eric, um, uh, uh, Joel, Ackerson, do a little bit of that stuff too, but for the most part, a lot of the band stuff, they, they don't like to play solo anymore. Oh, uh, Dave Barry. The, on that one. <laughs> the, the casinos don't like you too. No, no, no. Uh, as individuals, it's 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 a hard thing to do to be to play for four hours, you and a guitar in a corner, and it's it's if you're playing four sets in that four hours, sometimes you're gonna get a really good set. Other times you're gonna play for an hour straight, and nobody's gonna acknowledge you that, you, that you're even up there in the same room as them. Maybe you might get two two or three sets like that in a row, and that's enough to deter a lot of people away from doing it. Um, I think I sometimes still prefer have... it, though. Well, I would, but... I don't know. Because uh, I'll it's... tell you why for me. Uh, counting on other people to show up and have their shit together and everything else is so stressful yeah. that I would rather just, you know, like, keep it small and yeah. just do it. I'll just play it. I'll just do it. I have to be there anyway. It's, so It's definitely easier for scheduling. But I know, like, uh, Dave, Dave Barry... Um, and Cliff Porter from Jelly Bread, they do a good duo thing. They've got a good thing going on that that works well for that. And if you don't have to, somebody somebody try to tag Dave Barry and Cliff Porter. 
I don't, I don't want to attempt it because sometimes like when I start tagging people, it'll come up with like the wrong Dave Barry or something like that. So That's somebody true. who knows them, uh, tag them. Yeah. But, um, yeah, okay, so casinos, and that's kind of unique to, to Reno, like not every city has is, yeah. a casino situation. And I would so. argue that, going back to the Nashville thing, and I've, I've thought a lot about a lot about it, is I, I would equate the casino circuit somewhat to like the scene on Broadway, to where it's, uh, Broadway's obviously a little, a little bit more touristy and it's expected to go and see a band and that you want to hear all the covers and do that sort of thing but they're playing four hour sets with the band you're talking about broadway in nashville yeah. not, not new york broadway right. okay yeah. so yeah. I, I equate it kind of like that so it's like the gig that you have to take yeah and actually for nashville you don't take it because of the money well so for anybody but, who hasn't been to nashville there's this street called broadway and like <clears throat> you hear Every cover in the world coming out of like whether yeah, it's, it's bars or live restaurants, or, yeah, it's yeah, of some of the box. best musicians you might ever you might ever come across too. Oh yeah, no, it's not that, but it's it's totally the it's for the tourists. It's, you yeah. know, it's the tourist scene. Or like if you go to if you go to Vegas, not not the main strip, but what's that other strip in Vegas? What's that one called? Fremont. 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 That's you go there. We, that's where we usually stay. We don't. Yeah, we usually like to go there. There's a lot, a little more culture over there than the. Yeah, there's a little bit more. I'll tell you my Vegas story in a second. But yeah, Fremont. So Fremont is 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 like this corridor of just people wanting your money. <laughs> just the the like, yeah. and it's it's just all this this like touristy stuff all the way down. It's all, but it's also the old town Vegas where like the original yeah. casinos and stuff were. So it's a little it's a little it's a little more gritty. For sure, it's kind of cool, and there's there's a little more local bars on the on the side of that. But a lot of people like street performer things yeah weird stuff like kind of like a venice beach yeah like yeah venice beach of vegas maybe yeah so my buddies <laughs> and i went went to vegas and and first we were wandering around on on the main strip and that was like okay and then we we went over to fremont and that was like you said a little little grittier like a little definitely a little more um like color there or something Is some did you just hear somebody knock Maybe you gotta look through the window. I gotta, I gotta figure out if somebody just knocked. <laughs> this is such a super professional episode. Before. I like their kind of. Oh hi. Oh this sweet. This lady um, came to my door. I live up behind you. Oh. And her weird. Cat House out of her car like thirty minutes ago. She was oh, at the okay. corner of McCarran <laughs> and Mayberry. Hmm. So I thought I would just give you. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, the cat is Winston. He's a solid gray cat. Okay. And she is just if you see a solid herself, gray yeah, cat named Winston in windows, the neighborhood, and then her cat was missing, and she could call Ben. Assume he jumped out, but oh, so anyway, I mean, I'll keep it, an eye out. So if you do see, she's probably going to start putting up posters around the neighborhood. But, okay. But solid gray Winston, and if you could even catch him, and do you want to take my number down or not? I'm just helping her as a neighborly thing. Well, I'm in the middle of a live broadcast right now, oh, so, I'm so I, sorry. that's okay. <laughs> But yeah, I'll keep my eye out. Just keep an eye out. Yeah. I left word with the school. They've got my number. Okay. So. All right. All right. Thank you. There's a lost, a lost cat on the loose. I'm saying Winston, right? Gray, a gray, a gray Winston. Either this cat's name is Winston, or is there a Winston kind of cat? Oh, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm not sure. What's Craig see here? He, he'll be on the lookout. Yeah. <laughs> Be on the lookout, Craig. There for it's a it's a gray cat, gray gray solid gray cat lost on the corner of Mayberry and McCarran, right by Walden's Coffee Shop. Send out the alert. Tell all your friends. Yeah, and call Ben if you find him. Yeah, the lady had her windows down. And now the cat's gone. So, um, do you would you even know where to return the cat to? Uh, I guess I would just give it back to the this lady who just came to the door said she lives up that way. So I guess I would just go find her. <laughs> I don't know. It's not her cat either. But I'll just be like, here. Keep it until you see the the lost lost and found posters or whatever they are. Yeah. Cats are weird. They're like the most independent creatures ever. Yeah. It seems to me. Like I don't I don't I just don't I don't I just don't like the vibe of most cats. It just they just feel like I mean I understand all the debates and everything and <laughs> Uh, I just, I just feel like a dog, a dog is happy to see me. A cat's never happy to see me. No. So, 
And now, now it's probably me who has the attitude, and the cat's like, "What's wrong with this guy?" You know, maybe. So now it probably has flipped the script, the script a little bit. For yeah, me. right. Now they're reacting. to I'm me. just allergic to cats, so I, I have no choice. I am too, actually. I'm just like, eh, you're cute from a distance. Kittens, though. Kittens, on the other hand, are some of the cutest. Oh yeah, animals on the face of the earth. I think that that is true. Yeah, I'll go into <laughs> like full system shutdown after like. 24 hours around a cat. Yeah, it's not good for me either. That's about as long as I can last. But what were we even talking about? Oh, Vegas. Yeah, so yeah. we got to the end of Fremont Street, and I was like, this still isn't... I need to go deeper. I need to find... I need to find, you know, the black mirror of Vegas. Like, where... Where is... is the? I didn't see any locals on Fremont or on, on the main strip. And so, uh -huh. so I was like, I got to find out where the locals hang out. So I, I just totally went, you know... I picked up like whatever the news and review is of Vegas, oh, yeah. whatever they call I do it. That at every city I go to, I try and find their. their yeah, too. and I just found like whatever <laughs> kind of I found the art district of Vegas basically, yeah. and they had like a big thing going on, and it was like all these local handmade things and everything, and I was like, okay, now I now I feel like I'm somewhere mm -hmm. like around uh, around my people. It had kind of a midtown feel to it, you know. Yeah, so, it does kind of, and then just uh, I don't know. Which end it is, I don't, actually don't know what direction Fremont even runs, but um, on the opposite side of the where it dead ends into the big hotel, you've got a bunch of <laughs> yeah, local bars and stuff there. Brittany, Brittany, I'm so shocked that you've turned the conversation to wolves. Wait for your episode, Brittany. No, she says um, cats act like wolves. Things are on their terms. Yeah, I've dated some people like that, too. That yeah. sounds like the exact quote from Marriage. What's... What's theirs is theirs, theirs, theirs what's yours is theirs too. Yeah. <laughs> Winston the cat is missing close to... Oh yeah, okay, hey Josh. <laughs> this is funny. I like this Definitely. episode, man. <laughs> you just kind of go with the flow. It oh. is live. I mean, you can't, you can't script that. Yeah. A lost cat. You know what I'm going to do for Britney's episode? I'm, I'm going to see if I can get like the wolf pack costume. Like that, oh, yeah. that wolf thing. And just I'll just wear that during the interview. At least that head, like the wolf head. Yeah. You know, I feel like she'd be more comfortable talking to a wolf. For, it sounds like it. For an hour or so. Well, you know all of her wolf stuff, right? I actually don't. You really I don't? I don't know Brittany oh. that well. I think I've met her a few times. Brittany? In passing How do you out, not but... know Tyler? This doesn't make any sense to me. No, she's like way into, um, uh, she works at this wolf rescue. And oh, cool. So, like... It's not Animal Arc, it's something else. Okay. But it's I've got a friend that works at Animal Animal Arc too. Yeah. But no, like she's she's like deep into wolf advocacy and stuff. Like Wolves I think cool. at least to be fair, Brittany, at least half of your Facebook posts that I see anyway are uh, something to do with wolves. I'll have to pay more attention. So that's that. that's why I was teasing her, like, I'm shocked you brought up wolves. But um <laughs> But yeah, so uh, we'll have to do some something wolf themed for for Maybe Brittany's she could episode. bring a wolf in, dude. And raise some awareness. That'd be intense. That would that would be intense. <laughs> Pretty cool though. Well, and this is something she'll have to answer for because her posts say adamantly wolves are not pets. Wolves, you know, don't don't mistake wolves for dogs. That kind of stuff. But then she's got a wolf lick in her face. It really seems like they're pets of yours, Brittany. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe a wolf. You could bring a wolf. You could. Well, let's talk about that. I don't. I don't know. You might have to shoot on location in the. I mean, cats don't wild. like me already. I don't know what a wolf would think of me. Wolves are more like dogs. Yeah, that's true. A wolf would think of you as as food. If it was, <laughs> yeah, if it was cold so. and hungry. Yeah, enough. dogs. Dogs generally like me. I think dogs. Yeah, I feel like I know. I I relate to dogs better. Yeah. Than cats. Um. Yeah, cats are just uh, cats are too are too independent, and I don't know what that says about me that I don't like an independent person. Maybe they're independent. I should look. Uh, at, I should look animal. into that. Yeah, well, I don't know. They're low. They seem to be low, more low maintenance. Cats, dogs are a little more, more depend depend on you, but that, I mean, there's a trade off. Yeah, the yeah. I just get I, dog. I don't know what that says about me that I want them to be dependent on me. Like that's probably something I should sit down with a therapist and talk about. You might want to work that out. Yeah, I feel I feel like there's something there. So, <laughs> ecocentric. Yeah. So so okay. Um, you're so you're in the casinos. 
some of the gigs nobody's paying attention other gigs people oh, yeah. are but every time you you're out there playing your four hour set I mean you're just doing push ups every time it's a lot of work but right. it's also a, I mean if you're playing four hours a night um, if you're doing it right you should be getting better every time you play so I've worked I mean I I've well that's what I'm saying the push ups yeah exactly yeah. you're basically training yourself you've got to, if you're singing four hours a night and sometimes I'll, I mean I've gone on runs of like 13 nights in a row or something like that 13, 14 nights in a row of that if you're not singing properly, you're never going to make it through, especially singing in the smoke and late nights, um, you're never going to make it through a two-week run of singing four hours a night if you're not singing properly and not taking care of yourself to a certain extent. Um, so you have to learn learn about that, and then you, you can work on just improving your, and honing your guitar playing and that sort of thing. and. And just being improvisationable. <laughs> That's not even a word. Improvisational. <laughs> yeah. Improvis yeah. Well, okay, so I've been tracking you over, you know, all of these, all of these years. And, and here's, I'm going to say something that, that I mean as a very high compliment, and I hope it comes out that way. Um, when I hear you play stuff now, I think... Oh, he's he's playing a cover right now, and then you'll finish, and you'll be like, "That was an original, guys. Thanks, thanks very much." Uh huh. And now, to me, that like, that's a really, really good thing because that means that you're writing songs that sound r real or whatever. Yeah. You know, like, um, I think your songwriting is maybe maturing or something. I guess you could put it that way. Um, although. I never thought there was anything wrong with it before. It's just, it's getting tighter, I guess. Like you're zeroing in more on, on like, the, I guess the elements of songs that, that kind of grab people and, 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 uh, you know, connect more immediately or something. Yeah. So, um, so that's what I mean. Like to me, it's like, it's a good thing when, when you're playing something that, that sounds like somebody else wrote it and recorded it and you're just covering it. Like that's, that sounds popular already. You're you're writing something that sounds like oh this this is a this is a, I ought to be hearing this song somewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like that's a good thing. Now is that has that been an, an intentional change for you or just has that just come from repetition? I think it just comes from writing a lot and and continuing to do it. I know I don't really set out to have any sort of specific sound or. Um, any sort of for formula for writing songs or any of that or that sort of thing. So anything that comes out of me is typically something that I feel from head to toe. Right. So I, I, I have a hard time faking any, anything that I do, uh, which can, I think, comes across that way in the delivery and the songs and that sort of thing. Are you like, are you a, a prolific songwriter? Do you, do you like write a lot, a lot of songs? Because like, um, I've talked to some people that they... They don't write a lot of songs. They just write the good ones. Like, what yeah. I mean is, is they they have a lot of songs knocking around in their heads, but they don't bother actually like recording them or anything unless they are at a certain you know. Yeah, I think I I, I think of myself more along those lines. Like I, I'm I'm not a, a Nashville songwriter who will sit down and try and write ten songs in a day. That, that's probably an exaggeration. I don't. Know. Three or five, three to five songs a day, just to put out material, just to, just to sell and to try and um, um, get publishing stuff for. So oh I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm more. I've I, at any given time, I've probably got six or seven songs bouncing around in my head that are a various degree of finished. Yeah, um, and I tend to stick it out if I think it's worth something. Yeah, because like some songwriters, I mean. <sighs> 500 songs is, is just a, a start for some of these guys. Yeah, and you know? it's just a number. I mean, you th yeah. when you think... When I think about those types of songwriters, they're writing for a certain thing. They're right. writing to sell it, or they're, they're writing to get it published so they can sell it so that they can make their money to continue to do that. And that's a, to right. it's a it's kind of a totally different um, sector of the music business, which is it's, it's kind of a cool thing. Greg, or sorry, Greg, Craig, Craig is saying goodbye. Um, <laughs> he wants to know if I ever do a performers of the past themed show. He he would love to join. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, Craig. All right. Hey, thanks for thanks for hanging out, buddy. Brittany says she can bring a wolf in. Oh, I, yeah, I, I saw that. I was hoping that was the yes we can that she was Is referring that that to. Means? I hope so. I hope she wasn't referring to we can talk about wolves. Like, we can bring a wolf in. That would be, that would, well, either one would be sweet, but that would be really sweet. U.S. Wolf Refuge. Okay. She tagged it. That's cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, 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 I mean, getting back to what we were saying, I think, yeah, I, I'm more, a little more selective in my songwriting and I like to make sure that things are, if I don't like the song, I'm not going to play it for people, if that makes yeah. sense. If I'm not comfortable with it and I, I don't think it, it does anything for, for me on a personal level, I have a hard time thinking that it's going to do something for somebody else. I've, I've written a ton of songs that I've never played mm-hmm. out. Um, and maybe I've taken the time to record them just because sometimes I play a game with myself like, hey, can I, can I write and record a song in an hour? You know, and yeah, which is kind of cool too. It's a cool exercise to do. Yeah, so and it's it's like, it's good for like practice and whatever stats. You know, I can say I've written X songs, but like I don't actually, I don't actually go go play them because they don't they don't really like I guess rise to that level in my head mm-hmm. somehow. Um, but you know what this reminds me of is is like building an email list. I'll I'll make the connection oh, yeah. here. So like. I read this stuff about, you know, like, uh, get 10,000 subscribers on your email list. And I'm like, yeah, but who like, like, yeah, just who cares how many subscribers you have on your email list if they don't, if they aren't interested in your stuff, yeah you know? So like, why are we focused on some arbitrary number? You right. know, why not focus on get a hundred quality people in your email list. Wouldn't that be better than 10,000 random people? And I totally agree. It's kind of the same with, with songs. Like, you know, why not just write one quality song? Um, yeah. And sometimes, I mean, I've written songs that have basically written themselves in like an hour and I'm like, wow, that's really, that's really cool. It's, it's something that I enjoy. It means something to me and I'll, I'll play that for people. And then I've got songs that I've been working on for years that still have not, revealed a verse to me that I need to finish the song. It's like, eventually it'll come up. It's stuck with me long enough to where I know it's, it's something that's quality work. So I won't give up on it. And I go back to it and play it. Um, when I sit down and play guitar and stuff like that, I'll run through all the songs that I have bits and pieces of. And then occasionally a line will pop up here that'll lead to another line. And then maybe I'll get stuck and then I'll make a note of that. And then I'll move on and <laughs> keep it. It'll, it's yeah. just a con- continuously, uh, uh, evolving sort of process. That's that's a pretty cool. Um, yeah. So I was just talking about how um, on a previous episode we were we were talking about people who get stuck on a certain song and they and the song is never finished, but they never progress past that song either and. Like as somebody who leads a songwriter group, that's a point of frustration for me because I th- I think like, okay, set that one aside and just move on. Like take what you've learned from that and apply it and move forward onto a different song. But I also really like what you're saying about that. You know, it's okay to tuck it away and just kind of be patient. Like let it develop and oh yeah, maybe at some point that verse come along or something. Yeah, um, maybe the experience you you maybe you haven't had the experience that that will lead you to get that next point of view to put in that's a really good piece of puzzle you have not you have not lived you have not lived long enough to 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 write the song yet yeah yeah i I like that i have plenty of songs like that that are for for whatever reason a certain part of my life revealed this part of the song to me and then i'll get to the point where it's like well where where does it go from there and then i'll find out a couple years later be like oh wow that's perfect and then boom that it's pretty it's in crazy. that slot, it's done, and move on to the next one type of thing. Do you want to try playing the song? I can't guarantee it's going to sound <laughs> awesome, but um, I, yeah. I mean, if you, if you want to, you don't have to. We can, we can just keep talking, too. Why don't we pl- oh, I'll play a couple songs at the end? Would okay. that be all right? Or I don't know. If, is anybody watching that wants to hear a song? Um, is it, I don't <laughs> a couple know. viewers? Yeah, it's just down, to, just down to a couple. Craig had to leave. <clears throat> Let's see how long Ooh. we've been going here. Um, yeah, we're at like an hour right now. I don't know. I can play a song and then we can move on. I don't know. And it's, uh, 
Getting back, I was uh, interested in the comment about the emails, though, too. I feel the same way about, like, an Instagram or Facebook um, where a lot of people put so much uh, emphasis on how many people are following you and how many people like your page and all these different things. And I've noticed just even I've a ridiculous amount of number of friends on Facebook something like 5,000 friends or something like that. And I guarantee if I put out a show and promoted it for three months, maybe 5%, not even, pro probably 1% of those people, half percent of those people would actually like be interested and come out to a show. Yeah. It's like the, the, those numbers don't mean anything at all. It's, it's the difference between real connection and people that are interested in what you're doing and then just inflating your profile for the sake of that yeah yeah that's that's interesting and I, i'm kind of facing the same dilemma with with unsigned as we uh oh josh says i would like to you would like to what josh you would like to what i don't know what you mean you'd like to um same dilemma with unsigned like right now there are like 150 followers on yeah. the unsigned page but i know that they're actually interested Right. And I don't really want to like do like paid promotion and stuff like that because mm -hmm. I feel like that's just going to blast it out to people who probably don't care that much anyway. Yeah. And even if they like the page, it's like, okay, so what? Yeah. You know, what have, what have I, what well, have it's I a, It's the same thing with, I mean, there was a, a time, I don't even, I don't know if people still do it, but they'll put up a YouTube video and then they'll pay for viewers or something, pay for views. So instead of like, the hundred views that they get in the month that they submit it, all of a sudden they have 10,000, 20,000 views on this thing that, and it's like, I know you, I know you don't play out very much. There's no possible way that you have that many viewers look at your stuff. And, and what's the point of doing that? That does it make you feel better to have a high <laughs> number count on your views of your page? Or is it something that you just put out there and if people genuinely grassroots watch it, share it, watch it again, share it or into it, that makes way more sense to me as an artist. <laughs> I mean, I, I won't I'm not trying to fool anybody. I, I won't share the guy's name because we it's somebody we both know, but, but um, a few years back, this person came up to me and said, like, um, yeah, I made a video and it's on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I was like, cool. And I went, I went and watched it and I was like, all right, there it is, you know, he made the video, it's cool, it had a couple hundred views whatever uh -huh. um and i felt like i felt like uh you know good job yeah um it still takes a lot of effort and forethought to put something out like it it does and well and that's not the part i was laughing at the part i was laughing mm -hmm. at is i saw him like a month or two later he's like yeah have you checked my video lately man and i said no i mean i watched it and you know that was it and he said yeah well it's it's uh it's gone viral. It's up to 250,000 views. And I went and looked and sure enough, it was like over 250,000 views. And I'm just like, what? This doesn't even make sense. Like the song is all right, but it's not, you know, I want you to tell me after the podcast what it, what it is, <laughs> so I can go watch it too. Okay. Well, was, uh, it, was it on Facebook or, or YouTube? I feel like it was on Facebook or no YouTube. I feel like it was cause it was back. I don't think Facebook was even doing any video back then, but okay. Yeah. But it was like, all right, you know, you're a decent local guy, you wrote a decent local song, you put together a video, like, I don't want to take away from that accomplishment. But there's no way 250,000 people, you yeah. know, were interested in this over, like, the other content that they might have seen, you know, unless right. unless he paid for views, is is what I'm thinking. So, there's no way to really tell, I mean, honestly... Yeah, but for me, it doesn't really matter. The views the thing doesn't matter. If I like it, I, I'm going to like it, and I'm going to watch it, or I'm not. I'm yeah. going to watch it once, and I'm not going to watch it again. Or maybe I'll watch it, and I'll share it. Yeah. And it's, not, it's nothing personal. It's just like, I know in the back of my mind what I enjoy. Yeah, well, and so. you're, you're, you're more of a substance guy, and, and like <clears throat> even as we're talking about this, though, I'm totally guilty of going to somebody's page like 
going to your page and being like, oh, he's got a thousand likes. Wow, that's, you know, oh, hey, a thousand likes. You know, yeah. like I look at that number and I take it to mean something, even though we're sitting here saying it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You know, I, well, I, I look at the same thing and I don't, I don't know if, I don't think there's ever been a time where I've tried to promote, promote that page or something like that. But I look at that number too occasionally. I'm like, you know, even out of a thousand people that say they like my page, maybe a hundred of those people are are actively involved in checking it out continuously and wanting to know what what's going on with me. So it's like, I think even a lot of people with the whole social thing, I think people want to like things just so that they feel engaged or that you think that they feel engaged. Maybe it's an inflation of our egos, but yeah, I don't know. It's it's a weird. I'm sure that science will come out on it, and I know that there's plenty of science on social. It's a weird psychology, though. Thing. Yeah, def it definitely is. Like, um, it doesn't equate to anything unless you put on a show and people show up, or if, you know, what I mean, yeah, if you put out a CD and people buy it. That's the only. That's the only real, tangible. Well, my sign. my, it's yeah. It's so. It's so <laughs> the. I think the technology is is ahead of our like just human evolution i think it triggers mm -hmm. stuff that we don't necessarily know what to do with or how to have a healthy relationship with yeah. it because like i do these episodes my girlfriend casey likes these episodes but she hasn't liked this episode yet so like do we need to talk about that casey <laughs> or what you know it's like yeah uh it's it's stupid the whole it thing really is but it gets it gets in my head it, i think it, i think it's Right now, I think I think you're totally right. I think technology is is outpacing our mental capacity to handle it in so many different aspects of the world. But at the same time, with this stuff, it's like you don't know whether to feel guilty about something or feel like people don't like you. It just makes you way more self conscious than you need to be. And yeah. if, if things are gonna if things are good and they're gonna catch on, the best the best things in the world take a long time to catch on. Like you're not gonna start a business and in a year be the biggest thing on the face of the planet unless you've got a ton of money back in you and you can advertise and market and stuff like that but things grow at the pace that they're supposed to grow at. do you have a song with the line hey Joe what do you know yeah you wrote that right what's that song called uh Annie okay can I request that song yeah sure I'd like to hear <laughs> that song um and then yeah maybe we'll talk about it after you play it but yeah I want to hear that sure. song because you played it once a couple of years ago, I think. Maybe just a year ago. I think of when I finished it. It hasn't been that long. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little uh, quick little sound check here, yeah. Just to make sure that we have something somewhat decent. Hopefully my voice is in decent shape. I had a lot of... I played a bunch this weekend, so... <laughs> yeah. Hold on one sec here. Let me... Uh... I haven't changed these strings in like... Probably three months. <laughs> Probably not real shimmery. Well, I I always tell people, uh, you know, start with an apology. Yeah, always. These are my excuses for why it might not be good. So if it's good, hopefully it blows you away. I would make the excuse that it's early, but it's not early at all. <laughs> Well, I mean, early for a musician, it's so like 1, 1 What's going on with that? I don't know where I'd be without uh, electronic, electronic yeah. tuner. Well, while you're tuning up, so, so um, all, all this that we were talking about, about just technology outpacing us, I mean, yeah, you still, you still carry around a, like a regular calendar, don't you? Yeah, yeah right with there. A, with a receipt, apparently. Yeah, yeah, a paper receipt. Yeah. Also something I don't see too much of. <laughs> um, but yeah, then that, that baby never crashes, right? It never crashes. There's always the threat of it being lost. True. But it doesn't crash. <clears throat> okay, are you, are you ready? I'm going to step out of the picture here. I think so. All right, this is a song you were talking about. This is a... I don't know. This is a, this is a, it's a good song. country tune, I yeah. guess. Just last night I was thinking about things, where we end up, 
Where we thought we would be And how the tighter we hold on to our lives The faster time seems to slip away And in the back of my mind I started thinking real hard About all those folks who go and sit in the bars Reminiscing about the way things were How it used to be I started singing Hey Joe, I wanna let you know We can never move on And I still learn to let it go A lot of nice things to see If you stop dragging your feet Say we pack our bags and run away from the city It's a long road only for a little bit of you and me So you can jump in a car and drive it real far You can board a plane or a runaway train Hop on a boat, sail across the water And be guided by the stars the past is the past and that's where it belongs And that's why I'm here now Singing my songs So let your guard down, baby This is where your new life begins I started singing Hey Joe, I wanna let you know You never move on Unless you learn to let it go A lot of nice things to see If you stop dragging your feet And then what do you say We pack our bags and run away from the city It's a long road, lonely for and me some applause playing right now you can't hear it oh really yeah it's playing in the headphones but oh. you got some applause there it was like it's like a crowd clapping you'll oh, hear cool. it on the on the final one um Sweet. yeah so we were talking about uh just you know technology and how we use it and what our relationship is and it reminded me of that song i heard you play that song i don't know a year or more ago uh-huh and um there's no technology in that song that's about personal connections and a lot of i think a lot of your songs are that way yeah, I try and write at a more primal level, if that makes sense, or more yeah. like a grounded level than the. I don't know, Eric's me. If people can do it and do it and can do it well, but it, it, it's kind of an interesting thing to use things that are here now and going to be gone tomorrow in their songwriting. I think it's. Sense. I think that's weird too. Yeah, I can't stand hearing, especially songs now about like. Tweeting and getting a text or tweeting. Like, or... I, I, oh god, yeah, it makes me crawl. <laughs> My skin. <laughs> it's like it's such, it's such a passing thing. Yeah, those yeah. songs aren't meant to last forever. No, I don't. I yeah, I, I think the people who write them also know that it's just. It's I just, think they do too. Yeah, yeah, it's just kind of it'll it'll be relevant for a few years and then yeah. it'll then it'll fade. But what's the fun in that? Why not try and write something that's going to last forever? <laughs> or at least outlive me. I'm trying to write stuff that's going to outlive me. I feel weird even 
mentioning songs about telephones because um, yeah, I like I have a few like you know I called you or I you know so, like just mentioning any kind of communication technology seems to have uh, like a a lifespan to it. Right. So uh, yeah, but that's something I've always appreciated about about your songwriting. It's 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 always been like personal connection, personal interaction. Yeah. I think I think all of your songs are that way. Um, I had you in to a songwriter group you remember that you came in like yeah talked about your songwriting process and everything um where you were saying you don't really follow you don't try to structure your song a certain way you just like whatever it needs to be right you're there to serve you're there to serve the song right yeah as best you can which is funny because i end up writing i mean that song's a little more Kind of straightforward, but I, I can't even think of how it would be like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus type thing. It's definitely got. Yeah, a chorus I have, to I it, have yeah. those songs, and I think some songs are meant to be that way. But then I have other songs that don't really follow any sort of like, it's just a string of words put together, and then maybe a break, and then another string of words put together, with maybe like a common, yeah, common phrase here and there that kind of ties everything up. But it's more interesting to me to listen to that type of music. So do you do you feel like I don't even know how to ask this exactly but but like what what are you about like is there some nut that you're trying to crack artistically like when you sit down and write a song like like what motivates you to write the next song and write the next song and uh, you know like I don't even know if I'm asking it right but I, yeah I kind of know what you're saying um don't know it's just, it, there's not a sort of like I don't see a beginning and end to it uh, which I think is a is it's kind of cool so I I don't know what I'm gonna write about next there's like a there, there's always something that kind of grabs my attention that's like oh that's really interesting that that made me feel a certain way so maybe that'll come out into a song and then maybe I'll start writing something and then it'll spark a memory of an experience I had that was like oh yeah there's that that topic or that conversation that I overheard or that interaction that I had it makes me want to to describe instead of seeing to that emotion type of thing. So, um, I don't know if that answers the question. I think it does. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I'm if I'm totally asking the. the I, so I, I don't think have, I don't have I don't really have an, an agenda of what I'm trying to write as a body of work if that makes sense yeah that i guess that's what i was asking is is you know are you are you trying to get somewhere like is there a destination to all of your songwriting or is it yeah. i i think i think you answered the question though it's your your songwriting is just it's an exploration a reflection of your personal experiences and yeah. thoughts and and um trying to um put them into uh this artistic form that you've chosen, which is yeah. songwriting. I think so, yeah. And that is, uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff I write is super personal, from really personal experience. And then a lot of it's like stuff that I observe that people go through. That, that it's, it's stuff that makes me think. I think I'm just an observer, and then I try and channel that stuff. Yeah, yeah. It does, it, your, your songwriting style, oh, Josh, uh, Josh said he liked that song. Oh, cool. Who's Thanks. Bridget Mead? Thanks, Josh. Do you know Bridget Mead? Bridget. I don't know Bridget Mead. M E A D E. Hey Bridget. Oh, you know her. No. Oh, I don't hey, think Hey Bridget. So. Tell us who you are, Bridget, if you're still if you're still watching. Neither of us recognize your name, at least not immediately. Um and meet Tyler Stafford, <laughs> Bridget. <laughs> but uh let's see. So, okay. Um So here's something I went through uh, like two or three years ago, I went through like a super bad breakup. Like it almost killed me. And under different circumstances, I, I, I probably would have chosen to just die. It was like so bad. Um, and I stopped writing music for a while because I don't know, just nothing was nothing was sounding right. It just the whole I, I just it just spun me around. Mm -hmm. Um. But then what I discovered is a lot of the feelings and thoughts that I were having um, were difficult to express 
in songwriting, but they were easier to express in like just writing, like writing stories. And so I got, yeah. I got like really into like writing mm -hmm. as opposed to songwriting. And everybody was asking me like, man, where'd you go? You know, you have, you haven't been out playing at all, which is true. I haven't been out playing for a couple of years. You haven't been out, you haven't written any songs and blah, blah, blah. And at, at first I thought like, I, I thought like, yeah, man, this thing really, really sort of, um, I mean, it definitely stole my center from me, but, but like it, it, and it, the relationship caused me to, um, sort of set aside or give up things that, that were actually important to me. So that's why it was such a messed up relationship. Cause when it ended, I was like, Oh, I gave up all the stuff that I like, you know, and like yeah, now yeah. what? You can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I, right. That's the lesson I learned is right. don't, don't, don't do that people. But, um, but then, yeah, I still was doing stuff, creative stuff. I was still writing, but it wasn't, it wasn't music. Had, have you ever gone through any of that or have you ever tried like a different kind of art form? Um, no, but I think my, the reason I started writing songs stemmed from that sort of thing. It was more, I, I wrote, I would sit down and write and draw and do different things before I ever started writing songs kind of as a way to figure out what was what's going on in my head and like how I'm feeling stuff like I, I, I would write I don't know if they were necessarily poems but um, yeah uh, or songs but thoughts and ideas and free writing and that sort of thing I would just sit down and do that as more of a way to work things out I think it's if you go, when you go through certain things that are traumatic um, or when you're dealing with a flood of emotion I think it's really hard to sit down and actually try and work that out that's not the right time to do it when you try and have a conversation with a significant other when you're both super angry you're never going to get anything accomplished it takes some time to step back from it right. breathe a little bit process it and then come to come to whatever come to that discussion or that sit down and write with a clear head after you've processed it and ha gave it some time to to really think about it and to go back and experience it rather in the moment it never works out for yeah it seems like for me i don't know it's probably the same for you it makes sense why well, yeah i mean i think when when cooler heads <laughs> prevail that's that's when that's when you can make progress so what do yeah. you think would happen to you if uh if like something came along and somebody was like, Hey, you know, you'd be a great opener for our national tour or something like that. Yeah. Like, would you be up for something like that or, uh, if it was the right fit? Yeah. Okay. I think that's kind of where I'm, where I would like to go now. I'm, I'm kind of getting to the point where I'd like to do less gigs and do more shows right now. I maybe do maybe two or three shows at the most a year that I actually promote and put on and it's completely original whether it's opening for somebody oh, or I, I my, host myself yeah um, but I, I would I would really like to get into that's an interesting opening. distinction between gigs and shows you have to separate the two or else you go you'll lose all of your drive to <laughs> continue to be an artist talk, talk more about that so like why is it why is it important to separate the two um, because they're they're different you just get different things out of them. So is it satisfies a, a different part of Is a is a gig more like um like training, like honing your craft, it's the practice, it's the I would say so. It's, it's like the grind. Practice. It's the grind. Yeah, it's the pay and the dues, the paid practice, the grind, the whole that whole thing. I can't stand the grind. I really don't like the grind, Tyler. That's see that's one of my that, like my weakest the weakest point about my personality is I really dislike the grind to a point that I'll just convince myself that I don't like the thing altogether. Like that I yeah. just, that I don't want it. It's an easy thing to do. Yeah. There are, there are a lot of times I get done with a, like a four hour gig at night and I'm driving home and I'm like, what on earth? Like the paycheck is nice. It doesn't necessarily balance out. I mean, I've, I've turned down gigs that paid really well because I, I'm just not into it. It it didn't fulfill anything for me. And then I've I've also taken gigs that paid really well because I because it paid well. And then I get done with it. and It's like okay, 
I can figure out a way to get myself there mentally for that time that I'm there and then leave it behind. But it's not a fulfilling thing. Like I'd, I'd rather make 50 bucks playing an hour set in front of an, an audience that's there to listen to music than $500 on a night playing to people that don't give a shit. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Um, well, yeah, I mean, so, so like the current thing I can relate that to for me is this show unsigned. Mm -hmm. Um, like this part right here, this is the fun part, you know, yeah. then the grind is posting all the shit, yeah. following up with all the people. Hey, when do you want to be on? Okay. <laughs> let's schedule that. Oh, oh yeah. did you cancel? All right. Let's switch that around. Like all of that stuff. Right. is is t is the grind part of it and also like a huge chunk of the grind used to be um like after this video was done i'd sit there for hours and try to like fine tune it you know yeah and i finally gave up that part i just decided that that that's the part that's going to make me quit this whole thing right you know and and actually josh ortiz if he's still in here i think he is um, oh, hey, Carmel. He, Carmel's in here. That's, uh, she's, she's, uh, she's one of mine. She's one of my relatives. Oh, cool. Hey, Carmel, what's going on? Um, yeah, Josh, Josh said great tune, but Josh is the one who, like, this, this show has been kind of in development for like two years, and I told Josh about it a while ago, um, and he was like, cool idea, and then I never really did anything with it because... I didn't want to um, start yet another thing that I wasn't going to really be willing to grind on. Right. And so he came back after like six months and he's like, hey man, you know, whatever happened to that thing? And I told him I never did it. And so he's, he's been helping out and um, in a lot of ways, but, but actually the most helpful thing Josh does, he doesn't even probably know this, but... Um, the most helpful thing he does is he shows up here every Thursday, which gives me some accountability because I'm just like, damn, he's showing up again. I gotta, yeah. I gotta have something, right. something new. And so just him checking in and just, just being like, hey man, how's, uh, how's life? How are you feeling? You know, are you still okay? Let's, let's do this. Yeah. Like just that makes, gives me enough for the next week. And, and now, now the ball's rolling, you know? Yeah. And it's like, it's like, okay, it has some momentum of its own where I can see that like other songwriters are excited to come on and talk about their stuff. And, um, but it's weird. Cause like, even like, like even today before you came over, it was like 1030 and I was just laying in bed watching something stupid on Netflix yeah, thinking like. Do I really want to like? Where does this Where does this go for me? How many conversations do I want to have? I, I like Tyler, but like <laughs> I'm not like. Come on, you know. Yeah. Um, and then you know, once you got here, and then we started talking. Then it's like, okay, and 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 now I have energy for like when this thing's over, I have energy to go follow up with everybody and do all that other stuff. So yeah, yeah it's just motivation is such a tricky thing. That's got, that's kind of where the role of the show comes in. It's like. You can't have the grind without the polished performances. Like you have, you have to put in the time to do it. You, I mean, for me and a lot of my friends on the same level, we all have to do our own booking and our own promotion and all everything yeah. that comes along with it is us. Yeah, what you see is the entire thing. Um, obviously, people are there to help, and when you're really doing something, you you delegate responsibility, and if if you have friends around that can help you with that sort of thing. But for a lot of us, we're all, we're doing it ourselves and it sucks. And that, that's the part of it where there's plenty of times where I think to myself too, what the hell am I doing? Why, why am yeah. I wasting my time doing all this stuff? It's not satisfying to me, but at the same time, it's, it's the education and the practice and the, all that stuff that leads to when I get up on a stage and I have an hour to play original music for people that are listening. Yeah, every everything that I've built up over the last few months that I haven't played for people that are there to listen comes out and it ends up being a really good connecting show. I'm playing better because I'm playing all the time, um, again, and that sort of thing. So there's a, there's a trade off that happens with 
that sort of thing. But I think also at a certain point, you realize that you want to shift. Just like I worked in a restaurant, yeah. Started gigging, making money that way. I wanted to shift to play music that way. Now, gigging a, a ton, and I have for the last, I don't even know, three, four years consistently. Yeah. I'm at the point where I'm, I would like to get doing more of the opening show stuff. It'd be great to get picked up for a tour and go open for, I don't know, a couple weeks. A month, yeah, month long thing. Uh, I heard a weird thing stuff. about a tour. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, Carmel says she's liking the chat. Yeah, cool, cool, Carmel. Please uh, like like Tyler's page, like the unsigned page, share out this video that's happening right now. Share it out to your page, and then tag a friend. That's how this thing grows. Um, yeah, yeah. I heard a weird story. Uh, these guys I, I interviewed just a couple days ago, Athena, from Switzerland. So they were invited to come on a tour, but there was there was a fee. They they had to pay oh, yeah. to get onto the tour. Yeah. Have you heard of this? No, but I've heard... Well, I don't know that exact experience. That's not something that I would take advantage of. But any tour worth going on doesn't make sense to do that. Yeah, it was well, me, they, but I don't know the assertiveness. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know what their situation was, but they were they were saying, um, you know, it was worth it to them to. They looked at it at as kind of like a promotional expense. Like we're gonna we're gonna pay into this tour. You can write it off at the end of the year for taxes. That's, yeah, that's there you thing. go. <laughs> right, but we're gonna pay into this tour. That'll that'll get us. We're, we'll we'll be the opening act. Um, we can still sell our merch and everything like that. But but like basically, the tour needs to be funded, and um, because. I don't know if I don't know what like what the situation was for the main band um, or like whether they were making any money off the tour or not, but it seemed like the whole thing was kind of a loss leader, and um, it reminds me of this this shift that happened a while ago where um, now instead of venues hiring you, they'll just like hand you a stack of tickets that you buy from them and then yeah. you're responsible for going you know and selling yeah. them. Um, that drives me nuts. Yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a weird shift, and like I understand the plight of the venue owner, but um, it is it is a pretty strange, um, pretty strange thing. It makes it makes sense to completely offset the risk from the venue to yeah. the artists, because I've I've heard of that stuff in Los Angeles. I've um, experienced it not personally, but through friends and stuff like that, and. It's just, it's a really lazy way to go about things. Um, well, I, why not just go rent a room yourself? I well, that's, mean, that's right. basically what you're doing. You can't, I mean, and there, there, there's some validity to renting a venue, putting on your own show, doing the promotion, that, that sort of thing. Um, if it's a club gig... That's what I'm talking about. you pay to do that? First of all, they don't have a following of their own. They clearly don't book quality music on a regular basis or else they would have their own... Um, somewhat following, and then you have then you have the bands in there to bring in their following. So you've got a venue following that can maybe bring out a hundred people anytime you do a show. I mean that may be an ex that might be an exaggeration for smaller smaller places like this, but fifty people that will go to there just because they know that that place is going to have good music on any given night, and then you have the bands bring in fifty to a hundred people. Yeah, that's how that's how the promotional stuff should yeah. work. Partnership, pay, pay the bands. Right. Give them a bar tab or, or charge a door cover and let the band take whatever gets brought in by that and then keep keep whatever money you make on the night. But don't be lazy and put the entire burden on the bands or or yeah. book everybody and then do it that way. Well, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't that be weird? Set if, no if, standard. Wouldn't that be weird <laughs> if like the casinos flipped it on you and said, hey, you know what? It's going to cost you $200 to come play tonight and then you can earn whatever tips or whatever. Uh, well, you know, yeah. I mean, what the, but but there are there are places like um, I just learned um, Wild Orchid is a is one of the strip clubs in town. That's that's how how they work. The dancers have to pay to show up there and dance, and then um, you know, and then they they like make it back and hopefully then some in yeah. tips. Um, you know, for the for the dances they do and stuff, but like I didn't realize that I didn't realize it, they were they were like paying to be there because you'd think you'd think like 
doesn't the venue want dancers? Aren't they willing to pay for dancers to show up? That's like the that's whole the whole point, <laughs> right? So why are you charging the dancers? And they're not they're not missing out on their rent payments for the month. No, no. It's the same thing. I'm glad you brought that up because I going back to like a, not even a, not a pay to play thing, but I think of like even Broadway again in Nashville, where they have these bands come in to play for four hours. They're doing jukebox sets, so they're they're not playing their original music. Maybe some of them are. I haven't spent that much time there, but they're playing cover tunes to people that are spending a ton of money. The venue's making hundreds of thousands of dollars in a month, and they can't pay their bands a thousand bucks to play. They have to they have to play for tips. Yeah, that's that's weird. Is that just a supply and demand thing? Do you think they don't have to? Players yeah. players are going to do that because. Probably, I'm sure they probably make decent tips. Some bands probably do better than others, but at the same time, in a city like Nashville, where you're supposed to be, I don't know, maybe the music capital of the world, no? Yeah. You're not going to pay the well, musicians to play your venues? It's, uh, it's an interesting... Oh, hey, we have, we have more people here. Laura, Laura and Cyrus Elliott? Do you know those? Oh, people? hey, what's going on? Hey, yeah. Proud of you, Tyler. Those are my cousins in Bend. Oh, right on. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, we got a few. Let me let me make sure we didn't miss any other comments here. Yeah, that's just uh, goes down to Craig there. Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for joining, guys. Um, so, yeah, so so this whole there's like the harsh economics of supply and demand, and just like, well, we don't we don't have to. We'll just go get the next band. You know, like, yeah, if you're not willing to play for free, we'll give somebody that will. Right. So there's, there's that versus like what's, what's ethical. Right. And, um, you know, and there, and there, there, I think there is some recognition for that, um, where, uh, like I think, well, they call it like fair trade, right? Cause, cause like there's, there's some sort of, we recognize that, that even though these large companies have the bargaining power, to like totally put the little farmers in South America out of business or whatever, that that there's there's like a humanitarian ethical you know obligation to treat them fairly, even though like just supply and demand economics wouldn't. Well, do they're it. working. Yeah, we're working musicians. That's one thing that I can say about actually playing here, which I don't think happens very much around the country. Is the casinos that we're playing for are actually paying us money to play and we get to make tips and typically we get like a bar tab sometimes they give us dinner they we they take care of us really well that's like the saving grace of playing those types of gigs if it weren't for that i i wouldn't be playing four hours in a casino in a smoky bar loud Just, machines going yeah, off all the time people ignoring you drunk and trying to get up on the mic on your breaks and stuff like that i wouldn't be playing <laughs> in those circumstances if it weren't for can for we, a decent paycheck. Can we can we have one of those stories? Actually, I want to hear like a story. Oh my of, god! It like, happens more often than it should. Just people get drunk and then they decide that they can sing karaoke on the mic in the middle of the thing. I'm picturing like a bachelorette party or something. Just like some drunk chick. I actually I actually did Woo! play. Yeah, up at Harris in Tahoe, there was a bachelorette party that came through, and I actually had I had one of the girls come up and sing a song with me because she knew it. Oh really? But that was that's for fun. I mean, people that are respectful and asking, like, yeah, yeah. A lot of times I can judge the character or the state of the person. Maybe not necessarily the character, but like, I just have an easy excuse. It's just like, no, the liability of the contract says you can't get up here, which it's probably true. <laughs> but probably. At the same time, if you're here with a group of girls and you guys are buying shots at the bar and you're spending money and having a good time, and I'm gonna keep you here for a little longer. Get up and sing a song with me, and then sometimes respectfully those, leave the stage. It's like yeah, sometimes those people stuff. are fun. I've I've had some like it's more men than women that get really yeah they get like ooh bro let me get up and sing a song. I play guitar at home. I'm in a band. <laughs> like yeah. that type of stuff. It's like okay, whatever. I I never have trouble with guys, but there's 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 something about my my demeanor or presentation or something that um, just like. Drunk women get the signal that they won't get in trouble or something, and, and like I've had that happen so many times. Where are those? Two? They just get uh, like obnoxious. Yeah. Um, 
almost like almost like a heckler, you know, and, and you're just like, damn, I'm trying to play a song here. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but then, I don't know, sometimes those people are good, though, because they stop me from taking my own stuff too seriously. Um, yeah, well, yeah. Exactly. You know, so I guess I guess it all it all kind of evens out, but it makes yeah. for fun banter too. I mean, if you can, you learn how to deal with like disruptive crowds that way. Yeah, exactly. You learn how to diffuse a situation, or yeah. Well, and that's the grind, man. Is is like it's you know part of it. Figuring out all that shit so that when you finally do have your big show and you are that opening act or whatever, yeah, and somebody's trying to pull that. You know what to do. There's always going to be somebody that gets too drunk and needs to be the center of attention at a show. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, <laughs> do you know this guy's name, uh, Ray Lamontang? Have you heard, yeah. heard oh, yeah. that guy? Okay, so I saw him once at a pretty small venue in Santa Barbara. Um, and uh, this group in the front row was just, they were just talking and they were like on their phones mm -hmm. and like anything you can imagine except watching the show. And... Uh, and he stopped what he was doing and, and he said, uh, he said, you know, I still go to concerts sometimes. Did you guys know that? And he was just kind of talking to everybody. He says, yeah, I love going to, I love going to concerts. Um, and you know, I go to listen to the fucking music. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right at him. <laughs> He's notorious for that. Like not putting up with bullshit from and I, and I, I, I understand it. A lot of times that can be off-putting to me, though, too. Like, I don't know. I've, I've been to a couple shows here in the last few months where people show up and they expect people to, at a, at a club scene at the bar, for whatever reason, like, they expect people to be so enamored with their performance, whether or not they deserve it, like, whether or not you actually get the the audience's attention if you earn it it's one thing but they expect you to show up and be super respectful stand up close to the stage in complete silence and listen to what we have to say and it comes across <laughs> as super like yeah very pretentious very pretentious yeah you, you lose me right away i will i will if i am listening and that happens i'll go straight back and i'll grab a beer and i'll have a conversation in the back of the room and just like it's a few i oh, it, it Eric's me. My my wife knows that too. We'll talk about it afterwards. Like, what do you think about the band? Yeah, cool. I was super annoyed with the band. <laughs> it's like whether or not they were good is not. It's it's. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain amount of respect that you should have if. I do you're like show, going to a show that's a listening environment. Yeah, yeah. I do like <laughs> venues where they set it up as a listening environment where um, the band doesn't have to say anything, but there is somebody going around saying like. Hey, would you mind taking your conversation outside? Because yeah. I mean, this, this is a listening room, right? That'd be super like, helpful. I love that kind of thing, and I and I wish there were somebody. That's one thing you get in Nashville. Oh yeah, that you and and certain rooms that lend themselves to that um, around here in different places. But that in Nashville, people show up and they want to listen, and yeah, they might not even know who you are, but it doesn't matter. They're gonna get their drink and their whatever, have their dinner, and they're they're paying attention. Yeah, and and it is it is nice when, like, when that support is coming from the venue, and the venue yeah. is kind of going and and saying like, "Hey, we don't we don't mean to shut down your conversation, but can you move it outside because yeah. this is supposed to be the listening space." And usually people are pretty cool with that. Actually, most of the time they'll they'll be like, "Oh, totally sorry, I didn't I didn't yeah. realize that's what we were doing here." It depends on how respectfully you approach the situation. Yeah, too. yeah, for sure. But um, but yeah, I do like that. But I mean, if you're just if you're in a casino and it's a bar, like you're not. That's not happening. You're just it comes down to knowing knowing what room and audience you're playing to. Yeah, like, yeah. I would. I, I I don't know if I've ever actually. I may have called people out before, but only when it's the right time to do it. If I'm playing in a club or a bar, I know that the people are there having a good time and drinking, and then the bar's making money. They're gonna have me back. Right. I'll just play the crowd. And if I'm putting on a show where it's like indoors and it's a listening environment, it's more likely that people are going to be quiet. And if if and if it goes on for a while, I might say something, but yeah, I usually I usually do it like with um just kind of good humor or something like like if there's like like if I'm at a 
if I'm at a wine bar, like pl- just playing a wine bar or something, you know, I, it, I, I, nobody's there to really, I mean, they are there f- to hear me, but they're not there for me. You know, right. they just came to have a drink and stuff. But if there's like a super loud table or something, I'll, I'll be like, man, I wish I was over at that table because it like sounds so fun over there. Yeah. And, you know, all of us are over here yeah. just having to listen, listen to me. And that's where the party is. You know, we right. should all be over there. I'll, I'll be missing out on what they're having fun with. Yeah, it's exactly. that FOMO thing, the fear of missing out thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll I'll kind of mess with them like that, and then they'll they'll like wave and stuff, and yeah. you know, I, like if you make friends, it it works that way too. Yeah, and I, I also think there's a difference between a five dollar cover and like a twenty dollar cover, too. I mean, the, the people that show up to the shows where they're paying, that are list that uh, still it goes down to like what the venue is, but a listed environment, if you're paying forty or fifty dollars to go see a show, you realize that. Uh, I don't know, 500, 1,000 other people also paid $50 to go see the same show. Yeah. It's not, you're not just disrupting you or the music, you're disrupting everybody's experience for you being the asshole. Totally. <laughs> the asshole group that gets too drunk or that's just there to be seen or for, for whatever reason you're there, not to see the music, obviously. Yeah, yeah. This this friend of mine, um, Bill D. Luigi, he came to town yeah, a I couple played, weeks ago. Yeah, I played the, the show with him. Yeah, you played that, The Saint, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, and then there was a show the next night over at... Right, um, I can go to that, yeah. Over at Fine Vines. Here, I'll tag, I'll tag Fine Vines in here real quick. Um, Fine Vines... Fine Vines, this guy, Michael, he does, like, so much for the local music community and stuff. Like, he's, he has all kinds of stuff happening. He's built a stage over there and everything oh, cool. like that. Um, and, like, this, he, they packed him in. Like, it was, it was standing room only mm-hmm. in Fine Vines for, for Bill to play. And my, my only note, I mean, the whole thing was awesome. My only note about it was that, some of the people there were super loud mm-hmm. while the music was going, and that's an example of it. And people that, that was that was twenty five bucks a ticket. So yeah, and that's not. I mean, that's not inexpensive, right? And and so for and me, I, it's not inexpensive. I don't know. No, <laughs> and it's a small room, so I get it. Like people are going to the bar and they're trying to order stuff, and like you can't do anything about that. But like when you're back at your table having a full on conversation, well. Bill D. Luigi from Nashville is trying to play his shit. It just feels a little like, come on, you know why? Why did you? Why did you really pay? Mm-hmm. You know, if if you're not gonna listen, and everybody was having a good time. I just would have, I would have appreciated having, having that person, whoever it is, but having somebody kind of go around to the tables and be like, hey, you know, Bill's playing. We're this is what we're doing here now. The concert yeah. started. This is this is why we're open tonight. Yeah, kind, yeah. Kind of thing. Obviously, they might be open otherwise. But yeah, and I know that there, there's like a lot of competing interests because you don't want to make anybody feel bad about like coming to find vines right. and and anything like that. But but yeah, they they do they do that part really well in Nashville. So they they've got it figured out where the, like they make it feel like a listening room. Like when you walk in, you're just like, ooh, I think I better be quiet. You know, like it feels. Yeah, you set the tone. Uh, yeah, ahead of time. That makes sense. Yeah, and part of it is the responsibility of the artist to be. I don't want to say good enough, but to a certain standard of being able to carry a show. Yeah, too. That's I mean, true too. There's 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 something to be said to being an entertainer. Yeah, and, de- and definitely. To keeping people's interest because I've I've also been to shows where people have the attention, and then it kind of like fizzles off. There's no real ebb and flow to the show. It just kind of stays at one, I don't know, one level the whole time, and then. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you you've gotta know, you gotta figure out the audiences. Well, that was, you know, it's interesting. You, you didn't exactly say this, but this, this is what it made me think of. I remember when I was first, like, there's the craft of songwriting, but then there's also like the craft of performing, which is what you're talking about, and I think it's two two different like skill sets. And when I was learning how to perform one of one of the things i one of my goals was i want to see if i can get somebody to stop their conversation and pay attention over here mm-hmm. 
And I remember like the day I finally was able to make that happen, even if it's just a second, even if it's just like, hold on, you know, let me see what's, let me see what's going on behind me. Cause you know, everybody's like sitting at the bar, their back is turned to you or whatever. And, um, just, just getting them to like glance around and like, like what's going on over there. That was my first victory. Yep. And then the real victory was, uh, I remember this was in Santa Barbara, but these two girls were sitting at the bar kind of facing each other like we are. Mm -hmm. um, so one girl had kind of her back to me and the other girl was sort of facing me, but they were just having their own conversation. And uh, I started playing something, whatever. And I noticed, uh, so the girl who had her back to me, uh, like if I was facing the stage right now, you, and, and you, so you were you were talking to me, um, and I and I saw I saw the girl just kind of go go like this, like look past her friend and look over to see, and just like she was like totally ignoring what her friend yeah. was saying, and and I it, it happened, you know, like I held her for like thirty seconds like that, and that was just like the best night because I was like, yeah, now now like I hit on something, you know, yeah. like I think I can build on that now, so so yeah, there is definitely you have that. to pay attention to that stuff too. I mean, I I look at anything to keep me interested. I look at people tapping their feet. Who's Alyssa? Who's Alyssa Brown? Eliza? Alyssa? Elisa? E-L-I-S-A? Brown? I don't know. She's laughing. She's probably laughing at me. She's probably not laughing at you. Do you know her? I don't okay. recognize the name. I can, I can be really funny. No. Is, is that what it is? I don't... I don't recognize her. One <laughs> mutual friend... <laughs> Sorry, Elisa, Eliza, Eliza Alyssa. Eli Hi, thanks like for tuning in. Yeah, yeah. Tell us what you're laughing about. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So, so. But I, sometimes, I look for, like, like you said, I, I look for any sort of, especially in the environments where I know I'm not there as the feature thing. I'm there to supplement people's moods, right? Essentially, I look for people tapping their feet. I look for. Any sort of like eye contact back and forth. I, I scan constantly, scan the audience for that sort of thing, and see what's getting yeah. people to notice. I guess, and to yeah, do, and yeah. To, just to be into it, even if it's for a split second, like you said, those are you can make a game out of it. Just you can to tell, yeah. Pass the time, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, what was I? What was Sorry I thinking about? <laughs> no, I I don't know. Just yeah. So oh well. So so like if I were playing a gig at a wine bar like that, that's. That's what I would try to do. I would I would try to make a game out of you know. I wonder if I can. If, I wonder if I can get them to stop talking through sheer talent. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, that that doesn't always work. And and uh, like I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but uh, there was this night I was playing a wine bar, and because like my the my musical style I figured out it goes really well with wine bars for some reason. They're, wine bars are a little quieter. They're they're sort of there more to just kind of you know like listen and think about things and socialize. Right. And it's just that's kind of the vibe of my music anyway. So it works well. But but I was playing this this gig and I just I didn't want to be there at all. I could tell that nobody was listening. So I stopped singing and I started just kind of just I don't know just kind of humming along or whatever, playing nothing just not even a song. I was just improvising. I just, I stopped in the middle of my song and just started like wandering off, improvising and humming and just doing whatever. And I kind of finished the night like that. Uh -huh. And people came up afterwards and they said, that is the best <laughs> performance ever. That is so great. And, yeah. and like at the time I was mad cause I was like, you're so clueless that you don't even, you don't even realize that I was throwing the whole thing. Yeah. But, um, I don't know, like maybe there was something, it, it, they liked it. I, I don't know what to do with that kind of compliment. Yeah. Um, well, I think even subconsciously people that are having conversations are still tuning in and out of what's going on. So maybe they're not necessarily listening to every single word that's going on, but if it's a nice background, yeah, it, it enhances their, I think I made their wine better. Their night. Yeah. yeah. And their conversation and whatever was going on, it made that what it was yeah yeah and I, I think that's what they were saying was that it was like just the perf perfect yeah. kind of background texture yeah and that's just that's part of the gig <laughs> I mean, sometimes that's what you're there for yeah just to the just to kind of fade into the background yeah and just to just to be 
uh, one not too loud and not too soft, somewhere in the middle where people can have a conversation, enjoy themselves, and have live music going on in the background. That's part. That's yeah. there are gigs like that. That is really true. That that's I I probably I probably completely missed that that note because I wanted everybody paying attention to me, you know. But that's not what yeah. the gig was. You, you have to know your gig, and you can't you can't let your ego get in the way of the difference between show and a gig. <laughs> that's kind of where it comes down to. Yeah. Well, that's where all this that, that's where this whole conversation started was show versus yeah. gig. So yeah, sure. that's really interesting. So you, you wanna you wanna now do another transition from like less gigs, more shows, kind of push things more that direction. Yeah. As you're able. Yeah, and I think that I, I think that's on the horizon. I'm getting just getting more motivated to do. That. And now that there are more smaller rooms in Reno, it makes sense to do more consistent shows. Whereas before, it was either you had a tiny tiny little room that you could do, or like book out a showroom out the showroom for the night and try and do something massive now there's a couple of venues in town that are the right size to be able to do st things that are consistent and still be able to make it worthwhile um so you want to try to put together your your own show or do you want to hitch on to somebody else's thing well locally i'd like to, I, I want to start doing a little bit more of my own shows i i should be finishing up a, another album um for this summer so i'm already looking at at the end of the summer to um, book out a venue and do a big show again, kind of like uh, for, for my last CD release. Um, and then there's a couple of venues in town that I want to do, a couple of smaller remote shows, solo solo shows like that, uh, and maybe have some friends come on and share the night, co-bill and, and that sort of thing, and then yeah, and then do a big band show at the, at the end of the summer type of thing. Yeah, yeah, that... That would that would be good because I was looking at um, I think it was on Spotify or something, but uh, 2011. That was that was the last album I put out. Yeah, which is yeah kind of a long time ago. Yeah, you're one of those guys <laughs> like an album every seven years. Well, so. I try not to get caught up in the fact that people have short attention spans. So I don't I don't necessarily buy into that. I think they have short attention spans for stuff that's only meant to be around for a short amount of time. I haven't, I haven't forgotten about you, and, right. and I know that you've continued writing and, and everything else. Yeah. And well, so this, yeah, it, it's interesting because I actually haven't, um, like, I haven't been sitting around thinking like, when's Tyler's next album coming out? You know, uh, it's been a while. Yeah. Got to keep up. You know, I'm, I'm getting more and more comments about that recently. I haven't felt that way yeah. at all. I've, I've just felt like. Um, it's it's gonna happen when it happens and mm -hmm. if it happens and maybe it doesn't even need I mean it's, it's fine that it's good that you are working on one and I don't want to take away from that but it actually made me wonder like do you still need an album or you know are we are we now into sort of an era where maybe you don't maybe you don't need an album to mm -hmm. to uh, market yourself right you know I, I, I think it just depends on I think from artist to artist, artist, I think it depends now. I think there's so many avenues to sell singles and to sell individual songs. Me is my my own personal uh, adventure, <laughs> I guess is what it is, is I still want to put together a collection of songs. And I've, I've talked to people, friends that are have been in the music industry and stuff like that, and people that have been in the music industry for a long time, and, and they ask why I don't just put out four or five songs uh, like an EP a here EP. and there, or do yeah. like a couple singles here and there, and that's, I think that works for some people, um, but to satisfy my own creative pursuit, I think, it, it just, it makes sense to me to put together 11, 12 songs yeah. as a collection and, and have it something to where I, I, need, I have to be satisfied. I like that you work, that you work at your own rhythm, and, yeah. and some, I mean, for some people it works great to do the single stuff. Um, and, yeah. and EP stuff here and there, and, may, and and EPs I think are are good for um, for short run stuff and and for like maybe a couple a few songs here and there that didn't make it on a couple of CDs that didn't quite fit. Put a few songs together, release that as something on the side too, and yeah, it's just kind of an evolution of the whole thing. It just, well, it's, it's it's weird because like 2014 I think was when I did my album, and I guess that's like. It's at least three and a half years now. It's already, yeah. It's already... But like, it goes like that. I know, but I still think about it like, like, oh, I just did that. 
Like yeah, and the nice thing for me, I mean, my album, I'm, I've been ready to do music for a long time, and I've actually been working on this new album for a couple of years, but um, people still come up to me and say that my last album is in their CD player still, <laughs> in their car, and Elisa, 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 Eliza, oh. uh, she says, um, I don't think she meant it this way, but she said, sorry, I found you. I think she meant, sorry, I found you. My phone oh. is spooky. Put my name in with smileys, not laughing. Uh, I've learned a lot from you while I've been listening. Thank oh, you. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Josh Ortiz, uh, he suggests uh, a, a house show, a, a house concert with Tyler Stafford and Cowboy Indian. Oh, yeah. Do you know those guys, Cowboy Indian? Josh, I just met you the other day, didn't I? Uh, so, I he plays drums. Yeah, he, yeah, well, yeah, okay, yeah. so you play with Cowboy Indian. Yeah, I just met him the other day. He's a crazy, amazingly good songwriter, too, but oh, cool. he he won't let me ever tell anybody that, so oh, cool. you can't tell him you heard from me. Yeah, well, I was um, just over at Lucas's house the other day. We were talking about doing the con house concert thing at his house. Yeah, house concert. So I, would, I would love to play with... Lucas is another guy you should have on the show, too. He's a Yeah, I'm trying to get ever... like all those Cowboy Indian people yeah. onto the show. You could set up a band right there and do a... Do a little oh, live, think, live, uh, live band the thing. Computer, mm -hmm. come back. Yeah, so. heck yeah. Um, okay, we've been we've been prattling on for a while. We could go a lot longer, but I have a few lightning round questions to to help bring us in for a landing here. Okay. Okay. So the first lightning round question you've been thinking about this whole time: call out three people that you want to hear on Unsigned. Let's do uh, Grace Gatsby. Okay, let me see if I can tag these people as you say it. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, hang on. Grace G-A-T. Uh -huh. Yep, great. Grace Gatsby. Okay, yep. I think I got her. Uh, let's do Eric Anderson. Um, I get three. Eric Anderson. Well, do you want to just do novelists? Is that what you mean? Or specifically Eric? Because I'm not sure. Uh, you can, yeah, you, why don't you do the novelist? Okay. I don't, know if you'll, I don't know if you'll be able to get them all in in the same... Um, same day, but tag tag them. Yeah, this tagging feature. I know the novelists. There's a hardcore band called Novelists. I don't know where they're from, but yeah, here we go. The novelists. Okay, all right. And uh, how about uh, Jelly Bread? Jelly Jelly Bread. Okay, it's another one of these situations. Uh, of like, yeah, the top one there. Oh, is oh, it? No, 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 I don't think that's them. Jelly, hang on, Jelly, Jelly, do bread? Je Jelly Bread Love, try that, at Jelly Bread Love, oh, okay, all wait. one word, that might be them, no, hang on, let me, let me just see if I can look them up here, Facebook gets really frustrating, I know, I um, can't, can't stand it, <laughs> because you can type in, you can type in the oh, exact yeah, name, is this them, yep, oh, okay, so it is, it is, oh, it's Jelly Bread Music, okay, all right, um, on here, jelly bread music. There, okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll say call outs to Grace Gatsby, the novelists, and Eric Anderson. And actually, I'm I'm in touch with Eric. So yeah. Um, either Eric is a solo or with the novelists yeah. would be great. Novelists but, are doing a lot of stuff. So. But anyway, Grace, novelist slash Eric, and Jelly Bread, you have all been called out. To join Unsigned, to be interviewed on Unsigned. Um, next question of the lightning round is actually the last question. Oh, that was easy. Of, of the interview. That was fast. Yeah, it is, it's, a, it's a quick lightning <laughs> round sometimes. Um, so, basically, we want to know if you had to start over tomorrow and rebuild the empire tomorrow. Not you, So you don't have any of your contacts, you don't have your CD, mm -hmm. you can still have all your songs and what, you know, like just whatever, whatever personal talent you can bring with you in your head. You have that. Uh-huh. If you had to start over tomorrow, let's hear what you would do just in the next seven days. Because imagine there are a lot of people that are sit they're sitting out there on the couch. They've written a few songs. They have a little bit of a talent, but they don't know they don't know like how to how to get it started for themselves. So what would you do if you had to start over? So I didn't ha I didn't have any playing experience necessarily. You can you can have your current skills. Oh, you just can't have your current contacts probably do the same thing that I did before just hit every single open mic that I can and meet people it's the only way you make contacts is networking networking yeah when I when I first started playing I was I would 
there were more open mics I think going on at that time, but I would play like there's some some freaky number of like I think I played like seven open mics in like a five day span or something like that or I just get out and play as much as I can. That gets you in front of people. They go out to see that stuff and then it gets you mixed in with other artists that are doing stuff and then it eventually you meet business owners and that sort of thing and they turn into gigs and um, and then just play as much as you can. Don't turn anything down. Yeah. that's At first. That's, <laughs> and then start turning stuff down when you... That's when good you advice. to do that. Um, yeah, that's really good advice. And you know something I learned about Facebook when I... Um, well, I thought that Facebook was to get people to show up to my gigs and it never really worked that way for me. Right. But what did work is when I would post on Facebook, hey, I have a gig at such and such a place, other venue owners would see that and they'd be like, oh, here's a guy. Maybe he can come play at my place. So yeah. so actually, like in terms of networking, um, I learned that, that Facebook was good for like getting other gigs beget gigs. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you're not playing, nobody's gonna know who you are. And then if, if somebody asks you where you've been playing, then you can say, this, this is where I've been. This is what I've been doing, so I'm doing something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> that's, like, that's part of it. It's like a living resume. And then just go into shows and see, find out what venues are putting on shows and, and who's playing Yeah. also. Not everybody's playing open mics. True. But you can get in on the grass level there, get out and see shows, pay attention on the music scene, and start meeting people that way too. It's just... I don't know, just play as much as you can and immerse yourself in what's going on. Networking, it always it always comes back to networking. Every person I ask the question to comes back to networking. Yeah. So um so we're we're about we're about done with the show here. Cool. Um Thanks for having me. Yeah, is there it was a lot of fun. Do you feel good? Is there anything else you wanted to talk about before we no, close I, it out? I think we'll probably talk for another couple hours if we oh, sat dude. here, but <laughs> yeah. I'll come on again and we'll do it. We'll yeah, do it like in six months or a year, we'll check back, we'll see what the uh Tyler Stafford uh, um, movement yeah. is, is is doing then. Sweet. Thanks okay. for thanks for tuning in. Yeah. Yeah. Come thanks. Come see everybody. a show. All right. Well, um, so I'll just close it out here. I'll say uh, this has been all free for Tyler Stafford saying tune out. That's all right. Cool. Yeah. And then we're still. Uh,